Right. So basically, I'll do a few slides here at the beginning, and then we will be passing on to the, the our fantastic speakers. So I'll give you basically a bit of an introduction to the kind of uh, project coordinator for the Nature Harvey Networks project, which these uh, webinars are obviously a part of. So this webinar is actually um, the second session in a two-part webinar series. Um, so if you're interested in tuning the first one, um, which also which, which took place in April last year, the, the first event, um, these can be accessed on either on YouTube or the Ultra Wildlife NRN landing page. And I think Rosemary will give you a link to that in the chat very shortly. And for those who didn't attend last week, um, we will be also sharing the, the links to the recording from last week and this week with everybody once we've basically edited them and, and made them available on YouTube. So you should be hearing about those as well. Um, I'm sort of having to assume that we might have a bit of a mix of kind of new people on the call and also people who have already attended either the session last week or one of the, or more of the sessions last year. So I do apologize if there's a little bit of repetition, but hopefully there should also be a bit of new info to everybody on the call. And obviously there will be our fantastic speakers as well. Hopefully I will manage to get onto the next slide. There we go. So we have four brilliant talks today of various lengths. Um, so thank you already really in advance to our speakers who kindly take their time for them from their busy schedules to tell us about their work. And then we will have the Q&A or a panel discussion at the very end for 45 minutes. We will be recording these sessions. And like I said, we will be sharing them with the public and yourselves as well at a later date. Uh, if you have any issues with this, feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, you will be finding my email address at the very end. And I think Rosemary will be putting that into the chat as well. So if you have any concerns on that, you know, get in touch with me, I'm more than happy to chat. Uh, as before, we are using the webinar functionality on Zoom. That means that basically only the hosts and the panelists will have the ability to have their cameras on and mics on. Unfortunately, just due to the numbers of us on the call, as well as the, the nature of the event, it's basically just not very practical to, to bring on the screen, people on the screen individually during the Q&A. So I do apologize for that. But I do very much um, encourage you to use the chat uh, functionality to discuss amongst yourselves when, when you have any thoughts during the talks or during the Q&A. Um, if you have any links you want to share, feel free to share them as well in the chat. And also, if you have any kind of technical issues, we've got Rosemary here as a co-host uh, behind the scenes. And she'll be kind of keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so if you have any issues, uh, let her know and she will do her best to give you a hand. Um, when using the chat, do remember that the automatic setting is um, that you're messaging to the panelists. So if you want to have them kind of publicly available to everybody, you'll need to basically choose the all, all panelists and attendees option. There's basically, if you click the, the bar next to the two, word um, there should be a drop down menu there so make sure you, you are basically sending it to who you want to send it to. Um, for the Q&A session then uh, we are using the Q&A functionality so at the bottom of your screens there should be a, an option for Q&A and a chat separately. Um, so indeed please make sure that any questions to the panel are put there and not the chat. Um, one thing to remember um, is that you can tick a box there in the Q&A to keep your question anonymous, but also if you could make sure that you may basically mark down who your question is to. Um, again, because we have quite a few people on the call, um, there's a chance that we won't be able to go through all of the questions. Um, so do use the option as well to like the questions, just that that gives them an idea basically of kind of the, the priority between questions in case we need to prioritize. So I do apologize that there's a chance that we might not be able to, to go through them all. If you have any questions afterwards, obviously feel free to send them through to me. Um, 
I will um, uh, remind all of us how that works when we get to the Q&A at the end. Um, but basically, feel free to start adding your questions whenever they pop into your minds, even if that's during the talks already. Um, so to keep things manageable and, and fair during the Q&A, um, there's only one representative basically from each of the initiatives. We have a couple of talks where we have several talkers. So that means that we'll have um, four people on, from the panel from the, the four individual um, talks, as well as myself and Anne-Marie, whose face you might have popped, uh, seen before I put the screen up. Um, she's basically on the working group, so she's there, got to be there um, on hand to answer any kind of project specific questions. Uh, I'll make sure to highlight basically who those panelists are from individual talks uh, and, and, and make sure that basically we all know who are going to be on the panel. I'll put their names up on the screen as well uh, when we get to the Q&A. Um, we are delighted to welcome Catherine back from last week to chair the panel, which obviously that, mean, that means that that will give me the ability to join the panel. Um, Catherine is an independent consultant based in Wales. She's a Freshwater Biological Association Fellow and an honorary professor of environmental sciences at the Upper Swiss University. She spent a large part of her career in government agencies on the provision of evidence to support policy and operations. So she's very well um, placed to guide the conservation, uh, the conversation on the day. So we are very pleased to, to have her on board. Some of you in fact might remember her from uh, one of the uh, webinars last year. Uh, I think it was the second webinar, in fact. Um, so um, you probably won't see her, but in, in case you do, um, give us a little bit of a wave, Catherine, and, and we'll, but we'll, we'll obviously see a lot of you later on during the Q&A. Um, lastly, if we do have any tweeters um, on the call today, please um, do a lot of tweeting. We want to be trending if that's possible. Um, please use the hashtag Nature Recovery Networks and I and, and tag us. We have a project um, account basically, NRN underscore NI. So do tag us in and, and that will allow us to pick a, a kind of check up on them afterwards, which would be fantastic. <clears throat> Just to recap very quickly uh, why we are here today in the first place. So since September 2020, uh, RSBB and I, Ulster Wildlife, National Trust and Woodland Trust, under what we call uh, the Landscape Conservation Partnership, have been working um, on uh, this capacity building project uh, with generous uh, funding from the National Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, and it's really all about exploring how we could bring this concept, what we call nature recovery networks, into Northern Ireland. As part of the project, we have been looking at evidence and frameworks which we touched upon last week in terms of mapping and, and policy. Um, but beyond this, we're also exploring the potential delivery avenues and producing case studies to kind of showcase what these kind of individual pieces of the puzzle might look like. And that's very much more the kind of focus of today's session compared to last week. Just to remind ourselves what it is, what we mean when we talk about nature recovery networks, and I don't dwell in this too much because I'm sure there's going to be a bit of repetition uh, from last week. Um, now, basically, what nature recovery networks are all about is identifying and caring for really um, what we call core areas. So these are in the shape of you know our existing protected sites and priority habitats, identifying where do we have and where could we have corridors and stepping stones in between these sites basically to, to link them up, where there's potential for restoration and habitat creation uh, in terms of where that could take place and uh, to even eventually uh, to either eventually become these core areas or the stepping stones or corridors in their own right. Um, how these features and sites could be buffered from in kind of impacts of external activities and pressures, and as well, kind of looking at how the wider landscape could be made more permeable for wildlife. So we tend to kind of call them these um, sustainable use areas. A lot of this thinking has come from uh, a landmark um, report from 2010, uh, which was called uh, Making Space for Nature, that some of you might have heard about, which was produced by Sir Lawton um, and his colleagues. 
Um, and that report basically very much acknowledged the fact that we really need more, bigger, better, and more connected spaces for nature. Um, and these are the Lawton principles that you might have heard of before. But beyond this, it's, it's very much trying to kind of acknowledge that while the primary role of these areas should be about supporting biodiversity, we should also be highlighting the additional opportunities that these habitat and spaces can um, uh, produce uh, kind of joint benefits uh, for people in terms of ecosystem services. So these are things like, you know, uh, solutions, for kind of nature-based solutions for flood alleviation, recreational opportunities, climate change adaptation and mitigation and so on. And this is what we call nature carbon networks rather than ecological networks. That might be a term sometimes floating around. And that's why we've adopted this terminology um, for this particular project as well. So I promised last week that I would touch upon some of the aspects of what we have been up to uh, in addition to the mapping and advocacy work um, a bit more detail today. So while I don't really want to take too much time away from our fantastic speakers, I'll touch upon the role of these case studies that I mentioned a little bit here. Uh, the thinking behind the case studies really was to explore some of the potential delivery avenues for nature carbon networks in a little bit more detail. So namely, these are the roles of local authorities and future agricultural policy in terms of agri environment schemes. Um, with this in mind, we basically what we did was that we brought together staff across the partner organizations to discuss how we might want to approach these and what sort of things we would like to see within them. Um, but it also very much has involved discussions with wider stakeholders and, and visiting initiatives and learning from them. Just in terms of, of what that has involved with the local um, authority case study, for example, um, we got together with Arts of North Down Borough Council to explore where nature carbon networks might fit in their upcoming biodiversity action plan. On the top picture here, we are down in Fingal, for example, where we visited the local council's biodiversity officer, Hans, uh, who you might remember from uh, one of our webinars last year. Uh, as Fingal, basically, uh, the Fingal County Council has been working on this for a good part of 10 years. It was quite a useful kind of visit for us to see a lot of it in, in practice and, and learn kind of how things has worked out for them, which was a really interesting visit. The second case study, like I mentioned, is looking at the, what sort of role future agricultural policy might have in, in our end delivery. As many of you on the call probably know, it's this the kind of policy area is very much in development at the moment, which is obviously often an opportunity in itself uh, for that reason, for NRNs. Um, what this work um, <clears throat> As involved, obviously, we again brought together uh, expertise from across the partnership. But also, we have been tuning into what has already been happening, both in Northern Ireland, but more widely elsewhere as well, and the kind of lessons that they've been learning. So in the pictures here, for example, uh, the first one there on the left, we are up in Belfast Hills, learning from the nature, um, nature Friendly Farming Network. And I think the other picture there is from Spring Hill, a national trust site where we basically held a bit of a kind of a brainstorming workshop between the partners. I don't really want to go into more detail as these are both very much in development still. Um, and we really want to basically hear from our speakers because we, that might spark some ideas as well. Um, but obviously this is very much about kind of feeding it all towards this bigger picture and linking all of these up. So the aim for today is to move, I guess, away from that kind of strategic level, which is what we, where we focused last week, and looking at some of these specific individual pieces of the puzzle in terms of potential delivery mechanisms for NRNs. We've got a brilliant set of speakers who kindly have taken their time. So um, I'm really excited really to hear from them today. Um, we've asked, each of our speaker to give an overview of their work area and to touch upon keys for success as well as 
biggest challenges they see for NRM delivery to help us basically start this sort of conversations about where we might go next. I'll try to, uh, my, I'll try my best to keep us in on schedule considering especially the nice day that we have today. Um, so just to remind you all like speakers that I will be giving you that two minute warning before your time is up. Um, just to kind of get us all engaged as well, I've prepped us a um, slider link. Um, basically, what will this should hopefully be able to do. If not, we will skip it. Basically, um, what I was hoping to be able to do is to basically pose a question for the audience there and to hear your answers on this topic. But at least at my end, the screen is just looking very wide. Is that the same for everybody else? Can somebody give me a bit of a shout from the panel? Yes. yes. Looking, looking very wide. If that doesn't work, we'll just go on to the next slide and leave the slide OB. I might just stop my screen sharing very quickly and give that another go. If that doesn't work, then we'll move on. Technology, we love it. Right. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to work. So we'll keep, uh, skip the Slido. There, I'll, I'll try to make that work again, um, just so that um, we can use the Slido link later on. Um, but and I'll, I'll explain what that all means when we get there, but apologies. Um, we'll skip the Slido. And basically what we'll do is that we will um, hand um, the uh, floor to our first speaker um, and hear from them. That means that we're going to be a little bit um, maybe ahead of schedule, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, so our first speaker, or first talk really today, is about community land partnerships in Weta Conservation in County Fermanagh. <clears throat> the Boa Island Training Data Project is an innovative grassroots partnership primarily between Loch Earn White Flat Bowders Council and the local uh, landowners, which has demonstrated the benefits of bottom up conservation projects for red listed breeding waders species and biodiversity as well. We'll firstly, uh, firstly hear from Elmery, um, and I'm not going to attempt your uh, surname, apologies. I think I would butcher it. Um, so she's the Lock Earn uh, Landscape Partnership Program Manager. And she will tell us about the project setup. And then we will, uh, she, he, she will pass on to Michael. And Michael will be joining the panel later on. So just keep that in mind. Um, Michael works as the project manager for the Boa Island Breeding Waiter Project. And he supports several other community like conservation partnerships in the county and also run his, runs his own ecological consultancy called Earn Environmental. And basically, he will be discussing and telling us about um, the opportunities and challenges associated with this sort of a project model. So please, the floor is for you, Elmarie and Michael. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Nina. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Fabulous. Yes. So thank you so much, um, everybody, for the opportunity to um, be here today. And also thank you to Michael to very kindly give me a few minutes to kind of interject on his fabulous project to come and talk to you just a little bit about the Locker Landscape Partnership and one of the um, emerging um, initiatives that, that we're kind of working with that really fits within this community-led partnerships um, within, within County Fermanagh as well. Um, Michael, can you move me on to that next screen, please?
Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll just give you a very quick overview to the Lock In Breeding Wager Forum. Um, so as, as part of the Lock In Landscape Partnership, we work with around 40 different um, uh, organizations and groups in the area doing everything from both natural and cultural heritage projects um, in the region. So uh, we've been going since about 2018 and um, there is now um, quite a few streams of work which is just naturally emerging, you know, from kind of people working together and learning from each, each other. One of these things um, is the newly established Locker and Breeding Wader Forum. We started work on this um, at the end of last year, really. Um, so what this is at the moment, bearing in mind, it is a very emerging um, initiative, as I said. We decided um, at the end of last year that we actually need to have an informal discussion forum where we can actually give opportunity for um, people like Michael and various other people that we work with in the area to um, uh, get together on, on a regular basis and um, talk about the work that they are doing individually um, around the shores of Upper Lower Loch Earn, but also a bit wider, um, to, uh, to benefit the conservation of breeding wader species. So that really is what the, the um, forum is all about. Could we move on there, Michael, to the next slide, please? Thank you. So what it aims to do and what it aims not to do. OK, so um, we decided not to set up this very um, formal type network at the minute. This is very much a discussion um, forum. We decided that we at this early stage um, want uh, do not want to um, uh, work together formally, you know, under any sort of um, permanent structure or to bring people under any sort of um, umbrella project, but it really is intended for us to actually just work in the spirit of partnership, um, to look at everybody's work, as I said, and to kind of um, think uh, think about and promote the um, overall conservation of breeding wader species in this region and um, a little bit wider afield. But there is still a very much a, a focus on everybody working you know, on their own projects um, and delivering them independently. Thanks, Michael. Go on to the next one. Thank you. So um, in terms of the membership, so we work currently with three different organizations where we have formal agreements in place to deliver breeding wader conservation projects. Um, but the membership to the forum at the moment is wider than that. Um, we really have um, invited and encouraged people to come and join the forum if they have, you know, a wider interest in the preservation of, of breeding wader species in the area. So we don't see ourselves as an exclusive club. You know, we're really open to kind of en engage with as many people as we can around this subject. Um, so in terms of membership, so the Lock and Landscape Partnership, we are currently coordinating um, this forum. Then we have representation from the Lock and Wildfellers Council and um, Michael here will we'll talk to you in a few minutes about their fantastic project um, on Bow Island. Then uh, we also have a project with the Dairy Linen District Gun Club. Um, and then of course the, the um, wide ranging RSPB work also within this um, region around the um, island sites and the reserves. Um, and then uh, we also um, have representation from Ulster Wildlife, the National Trust um, in Fermanagh, and then we also have a couple of really passionate community representatives on that group as well. To the next slide, please, Michael. So we have kind of given ourselves a loose, you know, set of objectives just to kind of keep our con um, conversations focused at the moment. So in, in the short term, really, initially we thought, look, it'll be really good to learn from each other, go and visit each other's project sites. Um, and we've agreed to kind of start doing that outside of this breeding season. Um, we, we work on opportunities for public engagement. Um, and we did a really good project where everybody got together and, and we did um, some uh, public engagement work around World Curlew Day. Um, so in the medium term, then we're looking at things like data recording, sharing of information, you know, potentially getting into like a single access map, um, showing all of the lock and breeding results. Um, we're thinking also about talking to some of the farmers in the area around the issues that they might face um, around EFS and, you know, how we can 
kind of help put some of their concerns forward. Um, and then also all of our individual um, contributors are involved in research in one way or another. So this is about sharing in information and um, expertise about some of the um, research projects which is happening at the moment. And then a longer term um, objectives re really would be for us to kind of think, how could this uh, forum become a more sustainable type model? Because the landscape partnership, of course, is commissioned for a set period of years. So I want to make sure that at the end of the landscape partnership, that coordination role will then sit, you know, um, in a in a in a very safe place, so that these conversations can continue into the future. So that's just um, a very quick summary from me. Um, but what you really want to hear from is from Michael, you know, talking to you about the community-led partnerships and the fabulous work that they do with farmers up at um, Bow Island. So just, just to finally say, um, Michael, unfortunately, I need to um, run off straight, straight after this, but I want to wish everybody well for the rest of this um, webinar. The agenda looks absolutely brilliant. So um, I hope everybody has a fantastic day. Thank you so much. That's great, Anne-Marie. Um, thank you very much uh, for setting the scene there this morning. And thank you for the, the opportunity to, to be here to discuss our project and some of the, the challenges and, and opportunities that community-led conservation will hopefully play in the future um, in terms of, of nature recovery uh, at a broader scale locally. So I intend this morning just to provide a brief overview of what we have done to date. And then hopefully there'll be some interesting questions about how models like this can maybe be rolled out elsewhere. So just to set the, the scene, Amory has talked about the, the, the current situation in terms of LELP and where we are at the moment. Um, our, pre, our project predates LELP by, by a few years, four or five years. And just to set the scene of where we, where we came from, I think it's important in terms of replication of this type of project elsewhere. I get the screen to change. So our project really is quite innovative in the way that it is, is organized. The project itself began through an organization called the Locker and Wildfellers Council. The Locker and Wildfellers Council is basically an organization which looks after the duck hunting um, on Locker, which is a very traditional pursuit on Locker and has been going on, documented going on since the, the 17th century, but obviously people have, have hunted ducks for, for many thousands of years around Locker. And it's something that continues to be an important part of the cultural life of, of the county. And the council itself has been in existence for, for more than 30 years now and manages, as I say, the duck hunting on the log on behalf of the Department for Infrastructure. And from the outset, the council itself has been quite conservation minded. And initially, this work would have been really focused on quarry species, if you like, species like mallard here, for example. And the nest tube tunnels you see, which is the sort of the gateway into conservation work for the, the Wildfellers Council. Um, if any of you have been down a scale, you might see these wire and straw constructions around the town. They're really good at increasing the productivity of, of bringing mallard around the law, keeps them relatively safe from, from predation. Um, so that's the, the starting point. But as a key stakeholder around the law, and a lot of the guys who are wildfellers have been on the law for, for many generations, going back, they're introduced to the sport by their fathers and their grandfathers. There's a lot of cultural knowledge there and a lot of, of real on the ground knowledge. And they were very much aware of the changes in the, in the bird assemblage around the log, particularly the decline in breeding waders. Um, these birds had obviously suffered fairly significant, very massive declines rather in, in the last 30, 40 years. And the wild fillers were aware of this. And it's important to say at this stage that the species I'm going to talk about, only one of the species that we're going to talk about snipe is actually a quarry species that is hunted to a, a limited extent. The others are non are non quarry species, so there's no actual um, benefit to the wildfighters in terms of, of having birds to, to hunt and eat as a result of this work, and I think that's important to, to recognise. But initially, they decided they would look for some sites um, to undertake some breeding water conservation work, and one of the first ones that, that jumped out was, was Bow Island which is an island in the northern part of Lower Lock Iron. Although it's called an island, it's now linked, what well, has been for the last 100 years, by two bridges at either end. And basically those bridges mean that you don't get the benefit of being 
as predator free as you might be if you're on a, an island site further out into the loch. Um, the animals, like in the million predators, things like fox, can easily traverse back and forth onto the island. So it, it's slightly better in terms of predators than mainland sites, but not, not significantly really. The key thing about this site is that this is an inhabited site. Um, there are close to three figures of people living in Bow Island. And the vast majority of the land on the island is actually farmed. This is an active farmland site. This is not a, not a, not a nature reserve. And we'll come back to that point quite frequently today. We're working on active farmland that's farmed basically for cattle production for the most part, some grazing and some silage. Um, and I think that's really key that we are working in an active farm environment. The critical thing too is that the farmers themselves on the island were aware that the birds had declined, like the older farmers, and they themselves working with the white feathers were keen to work together. And this is, the, this is the critical factor within this project is that it's a grassroots project. It's not, it's not a, a project that has come from above, if you like. It's not, for example, any NGO has come in from the outside with good ideas to do work. This has very much come from the local community, recognizing that they have something special in their, their area and they want to look after it. And even more than like after it, restore some of the lost biodiversity that has been there. Now, what has driven these declines? And I'll not labor this, I'm sure many people know these, these factors, but really the, the, big, the big one for lowland sites locally and on the island of Ireland across Western Europe is the intensification of agriculture. And it's very important at this point to say that it's very easy to get into a, a blame game and blame the farmers for this, but they were extremely well compensated by successive governments in, in London and in, in Brussels in the European Union to intensify and as a result of the intensification huge amounts of biodiversity have been lost including bring waders and now we're trying to, to reverse decades of, of intensification policy to try and, and move move forward for these birds. Obviously there are other factors um, we have lost a huge amount of habitat in the uplands to commercial forestry and that's something we need to be aware of going forward as people are keen to to plant more trees so we don't make this any worse for breeding waders. Um, some of the, the sites we are dealing with would have actually experienced not intensification of agriculture, but a reduction in, in agricultural input in terms of reduction in grazing. And this partially a reflection of the change in economics of agriculture in the last 30 or 40 years, but also partially a reflection of poor agri-environment policy in the past, where shorelines were fenced off, for example, um, for good reasons potentially. But that meant that the, the breeding waiter habitat was lost um, behind these fences where no grazing occurred and large amounts of money now being spent restoring these areas which were, which were fenced off. So we need to be smart about our future agri-environment work. And one of the, although habitat change has been the key driver of, of the decline, increased predation now on most sites for ground nesting birds like waders, likely waders, is, is a huge negative impact. Simply put, not enough young birds fledge to replace the adults, and predation is a major driver of decline now. On our project, um, mentioned climate change there, we're not going to talk too much about that, I'm conscious of my time. Our project seeks to address both habitat and predation issues. Um, we don't seem to work, we don't work in an isolation, just addressing one or the other. So from the start, we undertook independent monitoring rather than monitoring our, our own sites ourselves. This is to have a more robust baseline and a more robust suite of data going forward. We're working really with four key red listed species. You can see there the lapwing, curlew, red shank, and snipe, as well as an honorary fifth, the, uh, the common sandpiper, which wasn't one we really thought about when we began, but it's a, a bird that, that is amber listed on the island of Ireland, and it is a bird which, which experiences many of the same pressures that the others do. Um, at the beginning, the white fellers felt um, a little bit unsure as to the best way forward. And in this regard, this is an important point for community conservation. They engaged um, a key external partner to get scientific advice, and they engaged with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And the GWCT obviously have, if you're not aware, have a huge decades of experience of working with, with farmers in bottom-up community conservation and have lots of practical experience of working on the ground. We were very fortunate to get a man called Andrew Hoodless, Dr. Andrew Hoodless, to come over and talk to us. He's a, a well-recognized um, expert in terms of breeding waiter ecology. Um, and he identified a number of factors. None of these were really a surprise to us, but it helped clarify the thinking of the, organi of the organization. Obviously the habitat issues in terms of scrub encroachment, the desertion of waiters from key sites 
where they had been within the, the previous decade or slightly more, and very likely low productivity for the remaining pairs. So we had habitat issues to deal with, and we had predation issues, which were very likely to be impacting upon the species. But as is the usual thing in this, the Wild Fighters as a community organization did not have a huge amount of money. We were very fortunate in that the government department allowed us to reinvest the wildfiling permits money. So the money that is generated each year from people duck hunting has been directly reinvested back into conservation of breeding waders. That's a very, very neat and circular uh, approach to, to conservation. Um, but obviously this amount of money is quite small. Permits are not very expensive. Although we have a lot of members, we don't, we don't have all that much money generated by permits. So we have to look beyond that. And we were fortunate from the beginning to get money from various other government departments and agencies and from the Wildlife Habitat Charitable Trust, which is a, an organization run by the shooting community for conservation work. And progressively over time, we began to address the habitat issues. And very fortunately then from 2018 onwards, we have had support of LELP through the, the National Library Heritage Fund. And that has been a really important um, boost to the capacity of the organization to, to do a lot more work than we had done up to that point. So the habitat restoration doesn't just favor brain waders, lots of other species benefit from it. Um, you can see here the holes where a snipe has been feeding in some cleared ground. And then the, the re-emergence of wetland plants that you might expect to find in such habitats, things like orchids and common, common species like that, which would have disappeared um, when the, the area was encroached by scrub. We also, and I think it's important, and this is one of the, the benefits of, of community-led conservation is we're not, we're not frightened and we're not afraid to talk about predation as well. It's a sensitive topic, but it's something that when we're dealing with waders, we need to talk about. And primarily we manage corvids, crow species, mink and fox, all of which are potentially significant predators of, of breeding waders and their nests. And this is not just in Loch Iron, but right across, across the North, across Ireland as a whole. These species are a major problem for, for breeding waiter productivity. We ourselves undertake targeted seasonal control. It's not uh, a matter of going out every day of the year. We try to maximize the productivity in the spring and early summer by having as few predators on site at that time as possible, mainly using professional contractors with some volunteer support. And we use a, a range of different methods, best practice methods to, to deal with this. And I just want to throw this up very quickly to show you that one of the issues here, this is data from the south of Ireland, where there's quite a significant uh, conservation effort going on to see of curlew in particular, which are, as I'm sure many know, a huge conservation issue. And you can see at the very bottom, without labour in the table, with vast amounts of expenditure and, and effort, no shortage of effort whatsoever, about 0.5 chicks per pair are fledging from all these sites. And that is considered basically the minimum you need just to maintain the population. Um, it's not a situation whereby the population is going to expand at half, at half a chick fledging per pair. So you can see even with huge effort, it's very difficult. And the, and the driver of this, this low productivity is predation. And I have talked about some of the, the issues with regard to predators we can control. You get others such as this, another site from the south. This is a lesser blackback gull which has been identified as a, as a fairly major predator in Loch Iron in, in previous peer-reviewed research, a species we cannot control at the moment. And you can see, although lesser blackback gulls are not potentially a huge issue, when you have very, very few nests, every egg and every chick then becomes precious. And that just shows you the scale of the challenge. Two minutes what have we achieved to date? Three minutes, thank you. Nearly there, Nina, thank you. What have we achieved to date? Um, one of the, the spectacular increases has been in terms of snipe. On one of our sites, we have had about a 480% increase in snipe up from five displaying males to 28 last year. And happy to say we have very similar numbers again this year. Massive increase in sandpiper as well. Not labor these. Engagement, a really important part of the, the project. Lots of nice photographs here of um, different types of engagement, but I often think some of the best engagement is the engagement you get with the farmer when you meet him, when you're out on the land. All these things look good to the funder and are important, but the best conservation con conversations are often those that take place when you're actually out talking to the farmers on the, on the ground. And just to finish up, we 
think this model has opportunities elsewhere. The socially embedded model, rather than appearing from afar, has lots of advantages. Obviously, there are limitations. We don't have the, the staff or the budget of a lot of other larger organizations. So the need for partnership is there. And we really do need to work for the in the future to get more benefit for the farmers from this. Really, at the moment, there are huge challenges with the agri-environment schemes, and we need to, to move forward in terms of reform of those. And to conclude, our work is very much a work in progress. We are very lucky now that our, our work has spun out into other projects in Upper Lockdown and, and elsewhere in the, in the county. And we think this model probably has great potential in terms of reaching out into, into other parts of, of the island of Ireland. And the key thing I want to sort of say is the importance of working with groups, non-traditional conservation partners like Shooters is, they often have much better connections to the farming community than ENGOs and others. I can often get access to land at a level that, that ENGOs struggle to get. And I think that's where we need to harness the ENGO approach as well as the community partnership approach to get as much benefit for nature recovery as possible. So I hope I have just about kept within my time. Thank you all very much for, for listening to the, the presentation and I hope to answer any, any questions you might have later on. It's great. Thank you, Nina. Super, Michael, thank you so much. And thank you for sticking to the time very precisely. It's much appreciated. I think it's really interesting to hear the kind of um, challenges and benefits of, you know, that sort of a very kind of grassroots bottom up approach, but kind of what sort of limitations that has as well. So um, do you make sure that if you have any questions for Michael that you, um, put them in the Q&A and we can post them during um, the panel discussion to him. So thank you very much. If you don't mind taking the screen down, Michael, and we can make sure to, to prep for the, the, our next speaker, David. So in, indeed, uh, next up we have David Comston. Um, David is a principal civil engineer in the Department of Infrastructure and is one of the catchment delivery plan managers on the Living with Water program. David has over 25 years experience in the public and private sector, mm -hmm. having started out training to be a quantity surveyor before changing professions to civil engineering and joining DFI Roads as a road engineer eventually, where he worked in a wide variety of roles, including maintenance, capital projects, road safety and traffic control. Since 2014, David has been with the Living with Water program that was tasked with developing a strategic drainage infrastructure plan, SDIP, for the Greater Belfast area. <clears throat> David's main role in the development of this SDIP um, was integrated drainage investment planning. So we'll hear um, from David now about the Living with Water program. Thanks very much. And the floor is yours, David. Thanks very much, Nina. Hopefully you can hear me okay and see my screen okay. Yep, all good. Great, great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Nina said, my name is David Compson. I uh, wanted to talk to you today. I'm only talking for about 10 minutes today just on the Living With Water program uh, and provide an overview of some of the difficulties and some of the issues that we're looking at. I'm very aware that I'm talking to the Nature Recovery Networks and I'm a civil engineer here talking about a lot of concrete and hard engineering with major wastewater infrastructure upgrades and uh, that sort of stuff. But uh, I think it's important to focus on something that Nina mentioned earlier about exploring potential delivery mechanisms and looking at how we can work together uh, to meet common goals um, and looking at what how we can bring in as many nature-based solutions to mitigate against climate change uh, in terms of flooding and things like that, the more we can work together to um, produce areas of uh, biodiversity and amenity benefit for, for the communities. So just, uh, I'll, I'll go through these slides quickly. Uh, just to give you a bit of an introduction on the Living With Water programme, where we started from and, uh, and where we are now. So back in 2014, the Northern Ireland Executive approved the development of a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for Belfast that would target three main things. Uh, the main objectives being protect, protecting against flooding by managing the flow of water through a catchment from source to sea. Um, Enhance, uh, it's enhancing the environment through effective wastewater management and the provision of enhanced blue green spaces, and also to help grow the economy by providing the necessary capacity within our drainage and wastewater management systems uh, that would facilitate the, the new development. 
so the Living with Water program group was created, and this is being headed by Department for Infrastructure. Um, and whilst DFI is in the lead, there are many key stakeholders involved in this, and our, our program board consists of representatives from Northern Ireland Water, DERA and NIEA, Belfast City Council and the Utility Regulator. So the Living with Water program uh, plan was ratified by the Northern Ireland Executive and published uh, on the 9th of November 2021, uh, November last year. So just looking at the scale of the plan and where we're looking at uh, and talk about some of the topography uh, and issues we're, uh, issues we're facing. Um, the topo topography of Belfast provides a significant challenge in terms of our drainage and wastewater infrastructure. Belfast was built up around the mouths of the River Ligon and the River Farset and on the shores of, Loch, of Belfast Loch. And most of the greater Belfast area lies within a, a bowl surrounded by hills on all sides. Um, and this leaves Belfast exposed to the risk of all different types of flooding, river flooding, surface water flooding, and then tidal flooding as well. And to help manage this catchment and the size, we, we split our study area into four areas, three land-based and one, the fourth one was Belfast Lock, uh, and looked at the issues and pressures we were currently facing. I'll just point out on this side that this, the six dots that you can see located around um, the shores of Belfast Lock, they're the six wastewater treatment works that take our wastewater from our toilets and our um, washing machines and that sort of stuff um, and discharge directly into Belfast Lock once water has been, been treated. And just to give an idea of the geographical scale of the plan, this area is approximately two and a half percent of the land area of Northern Ireland, but it covers around 25 percent of the population. To run through some of the current issues that we're facing uh, under those three headings of protect, enhance and grow. So protect, flooding issues the main one. Um, back in 2018, the Northern Ireland Flood Risk Assessment um, identified around 45 areas of uh, flood risk. Um, indicated there's around 25,000 properties at risk of coastal and uh, river flooding. And around the same in terms of surface water flooding. Um, so of these 45 areas of flood risk we identified, there was 12 of these areas were identified as areas of potential significant flood risk, or APSFR, and these require flood management plans to be produced. And four of these areas, which you can see there highlighted, fall within the scope of the, of the Belfast plan. Just some examples of this, back in 2014, there was a tidal surge, um, which coincided with a high tide and strong wind direction. Uh, which led to a near perfect storm uh, in terms of tidal risk, uh, where, as you can see from the photographs, the, the water level in Belfast Law came within millimetres of overtopping the, the, the harbour walls. So that was tidal risk, looking at sort of surface, or sorry, out of sewer flooding as well. Um, this photograph shows a property in South Belfast where manholes in their garden are surcharging due to the amount of water coming out of the system. Um, and this is obviously carries a lot of nasty stuff, if you imagine it's coming from our sewers, uh, and this was flowing through somebody's house, which isn't pleasant. Um, and then just in um, Lattice Drive in uh, East Belfast, uh, along the route of the Conswater Greenway scheme, shows the need of the scheme that was completed there. Um, river flooding mixed with surface water flooding uh, created a lot of problems right there. Looking at the enhance end of things, I think it's fair to say that funding in water and sewage services hasn't kept pace with the scale of development over recent years um, and improvements needed to support directives like the Water Framework Directive. And this has resulted in constraints to the new water connections to our new sewage systems and instances of blockages and more out of sewer flooding. And this has also led to water quality issues throughout the area and in Belfast Lock, and this is in some way largely due to the combined sewer overflows uh, the discharge throughout the system. Now I'll cover a little bit more on what combined sewer overflows are later. Um, but we currently estimate that around 50% of these combined sewer, of the 340 combined sewer overflows in the plan are currently unsatisfactory. And this, as along with the, the continuous discharge of treated effluent from the wastewater treatment works, uh, is having problems in, in Belfast Lock, and particularly in relation to the uh, shellfish water protected areas. Um, whilst the outer lock currently means, meets uh, the Water Framework Directive of good status, the classification for Belfast Harbour and Belfast Inner Lock are at moderate status, 
and recent assessment by DERA has indicated there's a decline in the quality of the uh, shellfish water protected areas uh, due to the excessive amounts of bacteria. Give you an idea of what's coming through some of our rivers because of the CSOs. Um, this is some scaffolding that was erected over the Blackstaff uh, River in Belfast for a concert. Um, and you can see as the river levels have increased, the scaffolding pools acted as a bit of a screen uh, and caught a lot of the sewage related debris. Um, so if that's what was caught on the pools, you can imagine what continued on down through the river and out into Belfast Lock. And you can imagine then what came through that person's house earlier in one of those photographs uh, that I showed you earlier. Two minutes, uh, please, David. And then just looking at GROW, um, some of the issues we have with Belfast City Council, or not issues with Belfast City Council, sorry, the, the, the issues in terms of growing the population uh, and the, the, the plans that Belfast City Council have on a number of issues uh, relating to the uh, aspirational growths. Um, these could be hampered uh, by the lack of infrastructure within our wastewater systems. Um, just going on then through to looking at some of the approach, I'll run through these very quickly. Um, we are looking at the, the catchments, looking from source to sea and some of the pollution or some of the issues we have in the upper catchment, uh, trying to focus on the nature-based solutions as well on these, uh, but then taking through our, um, our, our solutions to reduce runoff from the surface water, from the, the surface areas uh, that we're um, trying to slow down water coming through the, the area. So we're looking at sort of peat bog restoration in the areas and stopping the water flow going down into our, uh, our urban and suburban areas of the city um, and looking at how we've, we've neglected our water courses within the, the, the urban areas, they're culverted, they're canalised. Can we reopen those? Can we re-engage with our water courses and provide areas of storm attenuation, uh, design areas that are designed to flood uh, and help recover whilst providing sort of biodiversity areas and uh, um, parks and amenity spaces for our communities. Just looking uh, at some of the other work we're doing in Belfast Lock, we mentioned about the, the, um, the shellfish protected areas. We're doing a lot of modeling uh, and looking at how the nutrients and the bacteria are coming from a combined sewer overflows, which are designed to spill into the, 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 the marine environment uh, to relieve the pressure within the system. But we're just looking at how we can do these in terms of our, our microbial source tracking uh, and our bacteria modeling and that sort of stuff within the lock with Northern Ireland Water and our partners in, in AFE. Um, and we're looking at some of the, uh, the modeling and how the, the, the tides within Belfast Lock actually also influence where the um, the best place is to discharge the final effluent from our wastewater, wastewater treatment works. I just want to move on to a couple of uh, issues or, or sort of plan outputs. I'm going to flick over these very, very quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, we're looking uh, through a number of areas in Belfast and these study areas and looking always in the upper catchment as a, as a starting point. What can we do in the upper catchment to slow the flow of water coming through and looking at opportunities throughout the, the cities? Um, and the areas to see where we can work with partners uh, uh, to deliver schemes that will help meet everybody's objectives, not just flooding, protect, enhance, uh, or protect, enhance, and grow. Sorry. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of uh, areas that we're looking at um, for potential schemes, working with Belfast City Council with our Fourth River Greenway scheme. This is an area around Smith's Tip, uh, or sorry, uh, Springfield Dam uh, near the old Mackey site in Belfast, if anybody knows it. Um, and looking at some potential we could have there for uh, storing some water uh, within the area. And one that we're working with, this is a scheme that's uh, currently in for planning permission, working with the executive office uh, through their urban villages uh, department, uh, looking at Ballysill and playing fields. And this is an area that is fairly underutilized green space uh, with terraced football pitches and that sort of stuff. Uh, and we've working with them, we're providing about 2.7 million pounds towards this scheme uh, to daylight a number of the culverts that are running through the existing park and creating three uh, attenuation bases uh, and wetlands that will store around 20,000 cubic meters of water during a, a heavy rainstorm event, um, which will significantly reduce the flood risk downstream. Um, giving, if we were to try to do this in a more uh, traditional approach, 
uh, where we would be um, upgrading the culverts through the town. We would reckon this would cost us around nine million pounds and probably wouldn't be able to get those culverts through the, the densely populated urban areas. Um, just another scheme that we produced, uh, we've completed, which is on the ground uh, in Belfast Castle. This was a pilot project of some natural flood management and catchment based solutions within the grounds of uh, Cave Hill Country Park, where we had some leaky dams developed. Uh, as well as this, we created an outdoor education space for visiting a school children to come learn about nature, learn about the water cycle and biodiversity, um, as well as some um, uh, as well as the, the the project to come and show uh, and look at the um uh the sort of the, how the nature based solutions can help reduce flooding so the last couple of slides just then and how long is this going to take and, and what are our costs well we're currently looking around about a 1.4 billion pound project and we're reckon this is going to take about 12 years and we're proposing a number of blue green nfm type solutions but we must be quite clear that this isn't going to solve any of the the the, the upgrades that are needed to the wastewater treatment works there's no amount of, of blue green work that's going to need um that will impact on the reduce the need for efficient and effective treatment of wastewater but we can hopefully mitigate against this and reduce uh, some of the uh, storm tanks that are needed by reducing the amount of storm water that's currently within our system um, but hopefully with working together with partners we can come up with sort of more sustainable solutions uh, for this and that's meaning us sorry if we've went over time a little bit No worries at all, David. That was super interesting. I think there's just so much potential for a nature-based solution. So I really didn't want to stop you there. And obviously we can take a few minutes away from, from the break as well. So no bother. Um, thank you very much. I think that was really, really interesting. And I'm really um, um, kind of hoping to kind of continue some conversation on nature-based solutions in the Q&A as well. So please, um, do put some questions for him as well and, and we can pick them up <clears throat> during the Q&A. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. Um, so next up, before we have our Will Deserve break, uh, we will be hearing from Rose Kremming. Rose is a Senior Conservation Officer with uh, Butterfly Conservation here in Northern Ireland. Um, Rose has spent the last two decades working in nature conservation in Northern Ireland for a number of NGOs and local government which includes the most recent six years working for butterfly conservation. The previous roles have included community engagement and biodiversity planning to conservation, and her current role with butterfly conservation is focusing on the conservation of our most threatened Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, helping to deliver um, butterfly conservation's new strategy between 2021 and 2026. She's delivered uh, butterfly conservation partnership work on the EU indirect funded CAB project for Mars Fertillery and is looking forward to opportunities on the horizon for these and other priority species and the habitats and landscapes they are found in. She's passionate about nature and advocate for recording and is very much behind spaces and landscapes that are bigger, better and more join up. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Rose um, from another kind of species perspective when it comes to NRA. So the floor is yours, Rose. Great. Nina, can you see my screen and hear me? Yep, all good. Thank Great. you. Okay. Thanks very much um, for um, inviting Butterfly Conservation um, to uh, give a presentation to the Nature Recovery Networks Group um, in Northern Ireland. So um, it's wonderful to be here and thanks for that um, intro. I didn't realize I'd given you so much, Nina. Um, so thanks very much. So what I'm going to do is just uh, talk for about 20 minutes about butterfly conservation's work, actually kind of um, starting at quite a strategic and high level, um, but hopefully towards the end, I'll bring it back down to uh, working with local communities and recorders and farmers in, in local landscapes. Um, but I just wanted to um, highlight the work of BC and what we, what we do, because um, it very much links in with nature recovery networks. And we, we have a, a long and strong um, and I guess a good history um, and foundation in this. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of um, documents here as well. And I think I sent some um, links to Nina um, so that you can go and find these afterwards, um, after the talks today. But Butterfly Conservation is a UK um, 
environmental charity organization working across the four countries of the UK. Um, and we are over 50 years old. I think we're 54 years old um, this year, actually. Um, we are um, a species driven conservation charity looking at butterflies and moths and the environment and their conservation. Um, and we have a number of directorates that work um, to this goal. Um, I sit in the conservation directorate, so my role is very much about delivering conservation action for our priority species and moths. And um, I'm very fortunate to be supported by um, an evidence and science team within butterfly conservation. So um, they work very much on uh, helping us analyze data, gather it together, see what we're doing, map where we're working, um, and then um, occasionally from time to time when funding allows and we have the momentum and maybe the evidence gathered producing documents such as these. So landscape scale conservation for butterflies and moths is an excellent document um, and I'd really uh, recommend it to you if, you if you have time to read it. And recently, um, and more recently produced uh, managing land for butterflies and moths or evidence. And this is really targeted at um, farmers and agri-environment schemes across the four countries and, and how we can work with farmers and how we do work with them. So I'd recommend that. So um, butterfly conservation um, really do tie in very well with nature recovery networks. And um, I guess I can hopefully I'll demonstrate that in a few minutes to you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about our strategy again, um, I suppose at quite a strategic high level. Um, last year, Butterfly Conservation produced a new strategy 2021 to 26 um, to, I guess, focus and um, help us help us focus our action um, on where we want to go in delivering, I suppose, our, our ambitions and plans for butterflies and moths. And this is very much, I guess, driven by the climate change and biodiversity crisis we find ourselves in and perhaps the frustration the organization um, is experiencing with not shifting species along species recovery trends and not halting um, quickly enough or, or enough basically the decline of our wider countryside and our priority species. So um, we just felt that it was quite timely to, to produce a new strategy. Um, and the top level goals of the strategy are to have the number of UK's threatened species of butterflies and moths, um, to improve the condition of 100 of the most important landscapes, butterflies and moths. And the third is to transform 100,000 wild spaces in the UK for butterflies and moths and people. Um, and I'll just explain a little bit more about what, what that means. So um, essentially what we, we do hope to, what we've done with this is um, butterfly conservation have a long list of priority butterflies and moths. And we wanted to hone in on this um, across the four countries. Um, the long list is a long list, and we just felt that we needed to focus in our, our, our work on some priorities that we felt we could move along the species recovery curve. We base this work on um, our country strategies for each country. So Northern Ireland has its own conservation strategy with priority species and priority landscapes in it. Um, and what we did was we looked at, at the four countries and reduced our list of 130 down to 71. So 71 priority species across the UK and of those seven occur in Northern Ireland. So I'm actually really delighted about this new conservation strategy. It makes my, my work much more targeted and focused. Um, so in Northern Ireland, for example, some of those seven include marsh artillery, large heath, cryptic wood white, the Irish plume, scarce crimson and gold. And I've added in a couple of additional regional priorities myself. So species such as small blue and forester. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to have the number of UK threatened species of butterflies and moths? So again, I've mentioned that we have other directors within BC aside from conservation. So we have research and science. So what we want to do is refocus our science program to increase understanding of why species are declining and how to recover populations. So some of those species I mentioned um, in the previous slide, I'll, I'll talk about in more detail and about how that applies to our local landscapes in Northern Ireland with our local partners. Um, we will establish a new threatened species program, so targeting conservation action for 71 species at risk. And again, we had an expert panel um, within Butterfly Conservation who sat and looked at our threatened species list and reduced that down to 71 with a whole um, uh, list, I guess, of criteria to enable them to do that. And we're also proposing that we will expand our monitoring program to demonstrate how well species are recovering. And I don't think I talked too much about um, our monitoring programs um, in this presentation, but hopefully uh, most of you on this talk today, or, or if you don't, um, I'd encourage you to go and look at it. 
uh, butterfly conservation um, with some of our partners like CEH run UK butterfly monitoring scheme, the UK BMS. Um, we have over 3000 translicts being walked across the four countries and 30 of those all species translicts occur in Northern Ireland with our partners such as National Trust and NIEA um, and Ulster Wildlife along with other communities groups who walk transects. So that sort of um, valuable information and data is being collected, but we want to extend that network for wider countryside species, but also some of our priority species in Northern Ireland. So one of the ways we're going to measure this, how are we doing this and, and how successful are we um, at achieving our uh, reducing our um, the, the threat status of species, we want to use um, a species recovery curve and each of our 71 species and the seven that we've identified that occur in Northern Ireland and the regional priorities have been um, identified on the species recovery curve. And each of these individual specific species will um, have their own actions sitting against this priority speak on this priority species curve to um, help us move them along on that. So also um, coupled with that and our priority species, um, you know, you, you might wonder, well, where, where are these species and, and where do they occur and, and where do we want to deliver this action? So again, along with our um, long um, species uh, list in 2017, we also developed a priority landscapes uh, map for the four countries. And this is Northern Ireland. And this is very much underpinned by um, designated sites and actually um, the occurrence and abundance of our priority species of butterflies and moths. So it's a very well informed um, uh, map. It's 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 um, in interrogatable, um, and we can share it with our partners. And we have shared it with our partners. So through our new strategy, what we also hope to do is identify 100 of our most, um, I suppose landscapes that we particularly want to focus on over the next five years. So while there are over 20 here in Northern Ireland, we don't plan to focus on all of those. Again, we feel that it's it's now time to focus on some very specific um, habitats and landscapes within, within Northern Ireland to maybe better affect change for, for species and for landscapes. Um, so some of the things that we've been doing to do that then, just getting down to maybe local delivery, um, we were fortunate to be involved with the RSPB who are the lead partner. Um, in a European interreg funded project called CAB, Cooperation Across Borders for Biodiversity. And our involvement in that is just coming to an end, actually. Um, I've been working on that since 2017 with a whole range of partners um, on different multiple sites, but it's been really exciting. Um, we had a capital works um, budget to work with farmers um, and we targeted areas um, at Munchies Moss and also in West Romana, Petigo and some cross-border work as well. Um, and it's been fantastic. So we have a small group of farmers who've worked with um, seven in local small landscapes, um, three in the Munchies Moss and uh, four, two in across the border and three um, in County Fermanagh. So it's proven very successful. We're getting the farmers together to discuss how they're working together, what they're doing, giving and sharing advice about um, EFS, showing them species, but also getting local recorders um, and volunteers involved. Um, and at the outset of that project, actually, we delivered a, um, I, I suppose we identified our core areas for marsh return. You can see that on the map there on the top left. Um, and all those dots indicate a, um, a known breeding population of marsh artillery. So you can see our focus there is very much um, County Tyrone and, and the West and parts of South Down. So mapping and data and records is, are, are hugely important for us and for every organization. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that butterfly conservation have one of the, the best um, species data sets um, anywhere really in the world. Um, and that really comes true from our partners and our recorders who are all part of communities and are all living locally and working locally. Um, and they share that data with us and we use that data to inform conservation action and to um, produce maps like these and, and keep them updated as well. So it's, it's really important data to us, but also getting on the ground and delivering action and giving advice for species. Um, one of the species we want to focus on the next five years, very particularly, is large heath. It's um, a species that is um, particularly, um, its populations in a, in a European um, sense, um, important areas for them would be Scotland um, and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Ireland. Um, it's a data deficient species. We just don't know enough about um, perhaps where it occurs 
um, and how, how well it's doing. And of course, we know that the habitat it's found in, which is peatland bogs, both upland raised bog and lowland raised bogs, is really coming under threat from intensification in agriculture, but also climate change. Um, so we think the species will tie in really well with um, organisations as well as ourselves taking action to restore and manage peatlands. Um, and species such as Archie can give um, a really good indication of how peatlands are doing because actually peatlands and the food plant it relies on, which is um, hair tails, cotton grass, um, requires bogs to be quite wet actually. So you can track maybe the success of your project through instigating monitoring programs or also the presence or absence or abundance of this particular species can also target where you want to go. So both at the beginning and the end of and nature recovery network projects, perhaps you can you can um, start monitoring for the species and managing for it. Um, also, not to forget moths, um, we do uh, definitely have some priority moth species on our list as well, and they're in our sight lines. We want to um, move them along the species recovery curve. Um, on the the left there, there's a, a species that's um, found um, in a few locations on the island of Ireland, notably the burn and also in a, um, a ribbon of sites along the North Coast, which are managed by um, the MOD and the National Trust and the Ulster Wildlife Trust. Um, but the species again is com coming under um, pressure basically from, from like, you know, habitat management or not actually quite understanding exactly what the species needs. So in terms of species recovery curve, this is way at the end of it. And what this species needs is um, research, but again, mapping, and understanding the nature recovery network um, process and how important it is really is very, so valuable really in, in butterfly conservation, understanding what we need to do to ensure that the species survives in the landscape. So it's um, connecting up the different reserves, making sure the habitat is there, making sure there's habitat there that the species can disperse in, in good breeding seasons. So um, it's, a, it's a really important concept for us. Um, and I just wanted to highlight another species as well, the forester, which we're particularly concerned about in Northern Ireland. Um, the last year and, and this year, we've um, uh, put a particular focus on um, trying to identify new sites and going back to historic sites where the species has occurred. Um, and again, uh, this year, we're finding that the only known breeding site for the species in, is in Peatlands Park. So um, again, this is a species that really needs our, our um, attention, but we do still con continue to believe that there are potentially sites in Tyrone and, and Fermanagh for them, but um, for that we need to ensure that uh, the habitat is there, it's not improved in the meantime. So work that's going on um, in agri-environment schemes, let's say, or um, on breeding wader sites, so ensuring you know, wetland sites are maintained is really important until we can get to those sites potentially to find the species there. Um, so that is really, I've, I've wished through that really quickly actually, and Nina hasn't come in to get my two minutes um, call, but essentially, yeah, I mean, um, species are super important, I think, in terms of nature recovery networks. Um, they are the building blocks for nature um, on, um, you know, advising you or telling you, informing you how healthy um, your nature networks are, um, and they can be fundamental basically as well in um, assessing how well your projects um, have gone out. So species, including waders, obviously, as Michael was ably telling, but also butterflies and moths from, from our point of view. Um, we couldn't do this without all our recorders and our partners who so were extremely grateful for them. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the Lawton Report, as Nina was saying, um, more, bigger, better and joined up is, is really important. But I think also for butterfly conservation, I think probably everyone speaking today, we do need more people involved. We are um, definitely at um, a tipping point when it comes to nature conservation and species. We need bigger ambitions, which is what we feel our new strategy is, and we're very excited about it. Um, we need better resourcing, so um, we're very excited to to have some new body, new person coming on board in Northern Ireland with us shortly to help us with mapping these priority species across landscapes. So that's fantastic and joined up collaborations to meet this call of more, bigger, better and joined up. So Butterfly Conservation is very much um, a, a, an organisation that engages and embraces partnerships. Um, and yeah, we continue to look forward to, to more of that through uh, new funding opportunities coming up. So yeah, that, that's me, I think. Thanks, Mina. 
That's super. Thanks so much, uh, Rose, and thanks so much for giving us a, a few extra minutes. I uh, didn't see that happening, but we, <laughs> we always want to, to, to you know, <clears throat> tell uh, about our work as much as possible. So I'm, I'm really impressed. Thank you so much. Um, so if you could take your uh, screen down, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think it was really interesting to hear from another kind of angle in terms of um, what the kind of needs and potentials are for species when it comes to nature career networks and, and, and obviously that balancing act in terms of how do we make decisions that are obviously in support of those species that really need our help and obviously the, the linkage between, you know, connecting sites and so on, which is obviously where this this is all coming from and obviously that kind of links back to some of that mapping that we talked about last week. Um, I might give a very quick attempt in case we might be able to, to work on that Slido just so I can leave that up during the, the break, but I'm not um, expecting that to work now having tried to, to figure it out, um, you know, during the talk, but we'll, we'll give it a go anyway. Um, No, it's just not happy today. Um, so what I will do is that I'll um, uh, forget about Slido because Slido hasn't uh, wanted to be my friend today. Um, and what I'll do is that I will let us go and have our well-deserved break. Now I'm not even able to show that slide. Well, that's great. <laughs> Um, so basically, if we could all have a break, uh, I think we need to let some of this digest a little bit. Um, um, if we could have a break for 10 minutes, so let's go and uh, freshen up our teas and coffees. And if we could be back um, at 11. So we've unfortunately taken five minutes from the original plan, but if we come back at 11, that will bring us back on schedule. Thanks.
So welcome back, everybody. Apologies with the hassle I've been having with Slido. I seem to have been able to make it work now, but basically the link that is in the chat, um, the you should be able to basically go and respond to these questions afterwards as well. I don't want to be taking too much of our next talk's time, but you should be able to um, go and give your responses later on as well. So I, I will be able to take record of them. So please feel to feel free to, to do so. Obviously, the idea was that I was able to, I would have been able to bring all of those responses onto the screen, but we, we do have a few there already. Um, and, and obviously we can see that just the response to this particular question, there's quite a few <clears throat> perspectives on this. But obviously I will I won't take too much time from our next speaker, but hopefully um this slide will continue to work uh, during our, our next um, Slido poll later on as well, and don't cause any further hassle. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Um, so next up before our Q&A, um, we have a bit of a, a group act, in fact, a group of four. Um, and just to note in advance, um, it will be Maya, uh, who will be joining the panel later on. Um, so the, the group ACT <laughs> will be representing um, a project coordinated by the Outdoor Recreation and I, which is all about mapping Northern Ireland's green spaces. Outdoor recreation plays a vital role in Northern Ireland and contributes significantly towards priority areas such as health and well-being protecting the environment, tapping inequality, growing and greening the economy and increasing active role. The green space mapping that we'll be hearing about now uh, follows up from similar work that has been undertaken in GB and will be used primarily to measure progress towards tar a, a target of 90% of the population being within a five minute walk of a quality green or blue space, which is currently proposed in the new uh, program for government and other strategies. Uh, the mapping layer is also aimed to help deliver targets outlined in, in DR's green growth strategy, such as helping the population find and engage with their nearest green spaces and off-road trails and enjoy the well-being and environmental benefits that come from a greater connected connection and appreciation of nature. Furthermore, the mapping layer will be able to inform public sector stakeholders with gap analysis, green infrastructure planning and resource allocation to enable more green connectors and corridors across cities, towns and landscapes. So I know the, the, the team uh, will be introducing themselves, so I'll, I'll give the torch to them. Please go ahead. Thanks, Nina. Um, my name's Maya Taylor, um, and um, with, 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 with us all, um, we also have um, Elizabeth from Outdoor Recreation NI, Emma from Outdoor Recreation NI, and John Hewitt from Geoanalytics, and they will in, introduce themselves um, in their various sections um, of, of the presentation. Um, so my background is a, a geographer and then environmental education, then community woodlands and, and looking at the, the, the start of um, landscape scale woodland creation in Northern Ireland and what that might look like. That's more than 20 years ago. I've been in Dara now for 20 years, um, primarily working on the Environment Fund, um, help, helping the NGO sector and councils um, to help deliver conservation um, projects and connect people to their environment through partnerships, funding, outdoor recreation, conservation, restoration, appreciation and enjoyment. And I guess today, um, John, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, really looking at, John, are you okay to move the slide? Thanks. Um, nature recovery networks and the access to the green space map, um, which, which we'll be um, describing in a while. Looking at connecting people and their environment um, whether it can also be used to um, connect 
nature networks and really that that idea that uh, people are great outdoors is, is the outdoor recreation action plan for northern ireland but it is our great outdoors and people are going to the great outdoors to see it and we saw the numbers going out during covid um how, how can we better interact with people so that when they see it they understand it and then they act and that's from absolutely every age kids teens adults into our jobs retirement our actions and interactions with the environment um so um in, in thinking about that and, and what we do for um access to the the the, the great outdoors um we um have uh I, I, I guess that it has to be everybody. So next slide, please. This really does, you know, illustrate how um, we needed metrics to be able to show. So we've designed metrics over the last couple of years, um, both as to what people think about the environment, how they interact with it. Um, and then the metrics of where our spaces are and how they are connected together and how much people use them. Um, some of our statistics from that are in the People in the Outdoors Monitor for Northern Ireland, um, which um, we'll be able to share the links to that later. Um, it, it just shows that, that um, the level of concern for the natural environment as, as in the UK um, monitoring engagement in the natural environment um, questionnaires every every number of years that, that as connection to the environment increases, people's care for it and therefore acting for it increases. Um, and there is also then a, a people, nature and health report um, that, that, that helps to illustrate that further. So another another reference document for you. Next slide, please. As a bit of background, um, as far back, in fact, even before the Nature Conservation and Amenity Lands Order of 1985, there was there was a, an, an Amenity Lands Act in 65. Um, ju just to note there, the two things came together, nature conservation and amenity lands. Um, people, the importance of people and their environment. So, I mean, the, the, the journey, is, as was discussed last week, from legislation being developed to policy, to action plans, to how much money is spent making it happen, but actually folk benefiting from it, either through their health um, or, or from um, actually the environment being in better health, being inspired. So we have our legislation, environmental statistics report, the um, environment strategy for Northern Ireland. There's 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 a big chunk of it now. You know, will 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 be about um, actually um, connecting people and the environment. Um, so, so that healthy and accessible environment of landscapes that everyone can connect with and enjoy, just so important. Um, so next slide, please. And, and within the um, environment strategy, the, these are the strands that are there. Um, again, next slide, please. Um, so. Our, our, our steps towards that, we, we've got the Outdoor Recreation Action Plan, we've got a cross-government body that looks after that. Um, when we have these green and blue spaces, and we saw a couple of slides ago, you know, Belfast and a number of other places have green and blue infrastructure plans. Um, but what we want to be able to do with this map is actually to be able to sit, see how that sits together across the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, so, um, and, and, and set some targets, um, which will be increasing um, the amount of, um, not just the amount of space that people have, the amount of routes that people have, but actually then maybe the time that people spend. Um, and I guess, next slide, please. When people are spending that time in nature, one of the questions I'd like to pose is, um, 
how well do we engage with people? Um, so we have out more NI as, as, a, a, as a way that people can see what there is and where. Um, if we go on to out more NI, even to somewhere like Killard Nature Reserve, which is absolutely stunning at this time of year for, for, for grassland species, for, for insects, for orchids. Um, but I'm not sure that out on out more that we um, tell people what there is. Um, so, so one of my questions for, 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 for this group here today is um, for our nature recovery networks and our connecting to people to inspire them to action, um, how could we better um, speak to those people who are going out more? Um, many of us have a few volunteers or lots of volunteers that do particular things. Um, we um, can can monitor in, um, I guess, giving people information before they go, inspiring people on site. Um, that slide at the bottom is actually, okay, so it, it, it's a heritage site rather than an, a, a, a nature-based site, I guess. Um, but um, Tullahoke Fort, Cookstown direction. Um, on the way in, um, it, it tells you all about the site. On the back of that sign, on the way out, it says, if you enjoyed this site, would you like to do these other things that are in the area? Or would you like to do these things that you can then interact with more and you can find more information when you leave in these places here? So how, how do we join together both people accessing the environment um, uh, knowing where they can go, which is what we're going to show you now, but us also planning for the future. And next slide, please. Um, talked about that one, really. Next slide, please. Oh, no nice map. OK, so th there will there will be a map later on. Um, it will show you where all of our public open spaces are that are publicly accessible um, and the um, the routes between them. And both Emma and John and Elizabeth are going to tell you now about how we got there. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for setting out that strategic context. So I'm Elizabeth Rogers. Um, I work as a specialist in training and insights for Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland. So Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland uh, is a not-for-profit organisation who um, try to make it easier for people to enjoy the outdoors responsibly. Um, I'm the project coordinator for this, so I haven't got any GIS brains inside of me, um, but my sort of focus is engaging with stakeholders and ensuring sort of smooth delivery of this project. So I'm going to set out a bit more of why the green space map is being developed, and then I'm going to hand over very quickly to Emma and John, who are actually going to get in and show you the nuts and bolts of it um, <coughs> and all the applications that it can be used for. So a few did you know? So the first one, did you know that across Northern Ireland, and this is all from our People in the Outdoors module for Northern Ireland, which has been set up through funding uh, by DERA and IEA. Um, did you know that in terms of participation, um, seven in 10 people go outdoors for leisure at least once a week. And that amounts to over 144 million visits for the year. So it's not uh, small in terms of what we're talking about in terms of outdoor recreation participation. Next slide, John, please. In terms of the activities that people like to do, what's quite uh, telling here is that a lot of these activities are kind of local and um, ordinary activities. So it's short walks that people maybe do on a daily basis, dog walking, spending time with children and running. So we've got to think about local probation. How do we get people um, into their local green and blue spaces onto their local off-road trails? Next slide, please, John. And in terms of the benefits, so Pumney, um, importantly captures what people say that they gain in terms of connecting with nature or a natural environment. So nearly 80% say it's good for their well-being, so that's sort of their mental health and well-being. We've got over 60% saying it's good for their physical health and fitness so in terms of getting out for exercise and getting those benefits. And what's particularly important, I think particularly for um, this audience here, that is that over 40% say that going outside um, 
and connecting with nature is a key motivator for spending time in the outdoors. And that's maybe also a trend that we saw, particularly over COVID, that getting outdoors was particularly important and that connecting with nature was particularly important uh, for people. And as Maya alluded to earlier, that we do see this correlation between people connecting with nature. And when we do that more often, then we see more pro-conservation, more pro-environmental behaviours within their lives as well. So it's really important in terms of how do we um, encourage and enable people to connect more with the natural environment. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, though, what we do see from the Pomni data, and this is quite clear, is that there is um, inequality in terms of access um, to natural um, spaces across Northern Ireland. You can see there in the graph that if you live within um, five minutes of green space, about 83% of those living within five minutes will get outdoors at least once a week um, for outdoor recreations. That's actually above um, the national average of 71%. And you can see there that the further away you live, the less likely you are to visit the outdoors um, once a week for leisure. The particular drop-off point you can see there is after 20 minutes. So if you're having to walk more than 20 minutes, you're gonna see a drastic reduction in participation rates. So that's why proximity to, to green space and being able to, to measure that is one of the core aims of this green space map that we are developing for Northern Ireland. Next slide, please, John. It's also just important to point out that getting people into the outdoors um, is a great economic contributor um, and this is important when we're trying to think about talking with other stakeholders. Um, but yes, getting people outdoors, it's not only good obviously for their mental health, for their physical health and well-being, um, and all those benefits, but actually in terms of societal economic contribution, what we see is that over 900 million is being spent annually. And so that's important to think that whenever people are going to the forest, going to the woodlands, they are actually um, contributing to the local economy as well. If you're interested in Pomni and finding out lots more stats about um, how people engage with the outdoors, the barriers they face, the benefits they gain, all of that is available on the homepage of Pomni, um, which is on our website at forward slash Pomni. The link is on the bottom of the slide there. And maybe I'll put the link later on into the chat pane as well to make it easy for you to access. Next slide, please, John. So that has hopefully shown you that outdoor recreation is really important to our society. Lots of benefits there, as I've mentioned. And lots of these benefits, um, they, they cross over in terms of PFG outcomes. So um, in the wheel there, you can see the outcomes that were listed in the last um, PFG uh, document. And so these, these benefits relate to health and wellbeing, protecting the environment, tackling inequality, growing and greening our economy, increasing active travel amongst the population, and enhancing education and learning opportunities. So it is becoming, and COVID has played a part in terms of making this a policy priority. We're now seeing much more um, effort and funding and enthusiasm going into this. And a terrific example of this, and actually much of this is down to the hard work and direction of leadership provided by Maya, is that in the new, uh, or in the draft environment strategy for Northern Ireland, we have this target that by 2050, 90% uh, of households should have publicly accessible quality natural space of at least two hectares within 400 metres of their home and at least one site of more than 20 hectares in size within two kilometres. So those are sort of standards now that we're seeing going into strategies um, and we're really pushing for similar targets to go into other strategies and, and into a future PFG. But if we're going to set these targets, it's important that we have an objective um, measure of progress um, because Pomni data, although it's really insightful, um, it's more of a perceptive measure. And um, so if we're going to place in these kind of very um, set metrics, we need to be able to, to monitor those. So John, next slide, please. Thank you. So the answer in terms of getting this objective measure is our green space map. Now that's the provisional name, that name may change but before it's launched. This is going to be an authoritative map um, of all trails, green space, and actually also blue space. And there's three main aims. So one, as I just mentioned, is that we can measure progress towards this target of seeing an increase in the percentage of the population within a five minute walk, which is typically sort of around 400 meters 
a quality green play space. We want this to be a map that is going to be used across the field, so by government departments, agencies, councils, and ENGOs for lots of planning purposes to do gap analysis to find out where there's a lack of curb provision. And then in terms of future planning to help with resource allocation and to understand uh, how demographics engage with the outdoors and how we can better uh, meet provision and interventions. And then finally, just to say that the data will be um, available on Spatial and I as an open data set and on Outmore and I for consumers and open data and I. So it's gonna be widely available. On Spatial and I, it'll be more data that is for stakeholders. So for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, government and departments and agencies, councils, ENGOs, like more and I will be much more for the consumer and consumer friendly um, information. And I think it's just important to say that this would not have happened without the direction and support of the Strategic Outdoor Recreation Group and funding from their NIEA. And indeed partnership, as you will see, and it's going to go into now in terms of how repeating has happened, partnership with data suppliers, which includes various government departments and agencies, it includes all our councils, it includes all our ENGOs within Northern Ireland as well. So next slide, that's probably over to you, Emma, I think, or else is there one more for me? Ah, there's one more for me. So in terms of the spaces that are being captured, so this map will consist of three layers, green space, blue space, and trails. And under those um, layers, you've got categories and types. I won't go into those. You can see that this is gonna be very comprehensive in terms of capturing um, all these crucial natural accessible spaces across Northern Ireland. Emma's gonna to touch on some of this in a little bit. I think maybe Emma, it might be over to you next. Yep, uh, that's great. Thank you, Elizabeth and, and Maya for introducing us. Yep, um, so my name's Emma Taylor. Um, I'm the GIS technician that's been working on the project. Um, so I've been involved pretty much with getting the data from various different sources, various different types into something with a similar format that we can use for the analysis. So if we go on to the next slide, please, John. You can see here the, the three different sources for trails data, um, which is in our trails layer. So you can read through your shells. Um, it sort of outlays the, the process um, that we went through to get these um, into the green space map. And if you go on to the next slide, John, we'll see what it looks like now. Um, this has also um, formed the network that we use to create the service areas for our proximity analysis, um, which you'll see when John does his bit. Um, next slide, please, John. So in terms of the green spaces, um, from phase one to phase two, which is our current phase, we've added in a lot of data. Um, some of you will be aware, because um, I've been hounding you for, for polygons, but I just want to say a big thank you to anybody who has supplied data and anybody who will. Um, it's, we couldn't do the project without you, so it's been, been great, thank you. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, just sort of a, an overview of the methodology. Um, you can see there the different types of data um, that I've received and a brief method of how I've made it to the format for the green space map. So these are just our sources. There's another couple of slides as well, John, um, if you want to keep flicking through. Polygon data, point data, um, tables with coordinates. Um, I've got those layers in, um, upgraded them to what we need, added in extra attributes. And then if we keep going, we'll see the outcome. Um, this is just some of the, the problems with supply data. Um, obviously it's not all in the same format. There's various different things that um, I've removed in the process of refinement and um, polygons with errors and um, so that's all been part of my work in the last few months. Um, next slide please John. And this is where we're at at the minute. Um, but in order to measure how close we are to increasing the tar increasing the population we need something to measure from. So in our current phase if you go on to the next slide, please, John, you can see how we've measured. Um, so we've created service areas to measure proximity analysis. So 
we've started this from an access point. Uh, method one was using where the OSNI transport network intersects the polygons. But as you can see from the example on the left, not all polygons intersect the road network. So we needed a better methodology, um, which is method two. So we've created access points 200 meter intervals for each polygon in the green space layer, which gives us a good, a good start. It ensures that every polygon has an access point, but in reality, it doesn't show what exactly is on the ground. Um, but it is, it is as close as we can get at the minute um, until we get into phase three. So I'm gonna hand over to John and um, he can talk us through some figures. Thanks, Emma. Hello, everybody. Um, lovely to be here. I, I work uh, at Sims Emma in, in Geographical Information Systems, GIS. Uh, I suppose what I try and do, I've worked on this project from pretty much from, from the start, uh, and it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, but I suppose what we've tried to do is capture the data in a way that we can use it to do good analysis with, as well as, well as mapping. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some of that. And some of those um, analyses are on the, on the uh, graph here that you can see. So. Um, the analysis we carried out, as Emma says, we created service areas around the trails and green space and said, really, how many people live within that 400 meter area, within that 10 meter walking distance off trails and green space? And this is the uh, numbers you're seeing. So the percentage of people across the whole province was 43%, just really at our, our, this is our sort of benchmark numbers. Um, it's, I think, useful to see the difference between rural and urban areas, which are very, very different. So the, the average in urban areas is 50%, but in, in rural, it's 13%. And what we used for that was the uh, development limits data set, which gives us sort of every area in the province that there were more than a thousand people live. Uh, so yeah, so, some more numbers here uh, around uh, yeah, the, the access to green space, um, let me see, uh, and really just, I suppose, bringing out the differences between uh, the, the rural and urban that I'll go on to show you as well. So without further ado, I'm going to try and flick over my screen and let me know if you see a map there. Does that work? Yay! Thanks for the thumbs up. Okay. So uh, the thing I say in every meeting, are you now seeing a map? So this is now a live interactive map of our trails and green space. So the first two layers I've turned on here are, are the trails and green space layer. One thing we've, we've done here with the, the trails is so we've, we've um, filtered them. So we only show trails where more than 50% of, of the trail is off road. And as I click on some of the data, you see we have the provider of the data, the type, what it is, how big it is. Um, we've also uh, quite, quite a few other bits of information that we, that we collect as well. If I turn off the trails for a second, just to really help with our analysis as well. So if I click on some of the green space layers, there we go. So there's uh, Slevenora Forest, who it was provided by, the, the category and type of data it is, the, whether it's public access or not, the angst category for it. So we're collecting lots of uh, attributes around the data and as I, if I very quickly flick over to this tab you'll see so this is the results of that analysis really asking what uh, what addressable properties in the province live within the 10 minute walk of those areas of green space so so everything in blue here is a, a house basically so these are the houses about four just over four hundred thousand houses who live within a 10 minute walking distance of um uh, some usable uh, green space or a trail. And I think what, what we found is it's really the most useful piece of analysis is to go into specific areas. So let me just show you a couple. So this is Hillsborough. And here you're looking at Hillsborough Castle, Hillsborough Lake. And again, these, these are the points. These that represent the people that live within that 10 minute walking distance of, of those areas. It's interesting if I turn on the census output area, uh, what, what we're using for this um, uh, calculation in this case is the scent is a super output area it's a, it's a good geography to compare because as a lot of you guys will know there's roughly 2,000 people that live in every census output area so it gives us a nice nice platform for comparison so the the darker blue you see here is the census output area for Hillsborough and you'll see uh, uh, there are you know a lot of people in the village that live within that walking distance but once you go out there are very few people in, in the area round, uh, round about that, that live within uh, that 10 minute walk. So the numbers for here are kind of 40, 50% on accessibility to green space. Um, if I go over Two to- minutes, sorry, John. What was that, sorry? Two minutes, please. Just... Oh, oh, right. 
Perfect. Just in time if you can, thanks. All right, okay. Uh, well, then I'll if, John, if you can show a pie chart, that'd be good. I'll go straight to a pie chart in that case. Yeah, so let me go, go to this. So this is really bringing it all together uh, to do some nice analysis on the data. So here you're looking at trails and green space on the map. As I pan and zoom around the map, it updates the numbers, first of all. You'll see the number of kilometers of trails, the air, hectares of green space. Uh, and also on, over here, the type of green space. Uh, I can click on a particular type and it'll just show me that type. There's public open spaces, uh, there's public parks, and the same with trails. So the, in, this, in this case, this is the source of trail. So whether it's Forest Service, Sustrans, or, or outdoor recreation Northern Ireland. And I can also look at, I think this really shows off Emma's hard work as well. This is showing green space by source. So if I zoom out to the whole of the province, here you're looking at, these are all the sources of data that we've got for, for, for green space. And if I click on a particular council, you'll see there, uh, to click on a few of these providers, you'll see their particular green space. So it really brings out the variety of data we have in here. It's a really rich data set. And if I have one minute, I can show you as well, a little bit of analysis we're doing here. Uh, if I turn on deprivation points and the census output areas uh, together, then we can do some simple analysis here as well. So we can say, so for the census output areas, show us where uh, proximity to green space is low. So this is the percentage of proximity to green space. And at the same time, show us the areas that are deprived. So if I bring this down and just show us the lower noble indicators. So there we're trying to, it's a quite a nice effective way to say, okay, well, there, there's where both there's a, a low proximity to green space and also they're, they're deprived areas. So- And John, if I can just um, jump in then and um, just linking on to that, could we have a look at the last of our slides about the applications and nature recovery networks? Absolutely. You go, Maya. Brilliant. Um, Elizabeth, chip in if you want to at any stage. But just to say, so we, we have figures about um, in the people in the outdoors monitor Northern Ireland about, about what people use, how, what they think of. Is there anything that we would want to add to those questions in the future about people's interaction with nature? There are questions in there, but, but potentially in the future that could be added again, because we would hope to run that every few years. Um, having, having mapped what we have, we want to look at planning, both in terms of connecting people better, and, and that will be for all of us, um, but also in terms of planning where we target action but also then how we connect people to it um, and, and I guess you know looking back at the the green the nature recovery networks more bigger better more connected um, you know we want more access but also we want more more nature um, bigger um, better um, better in terms of accessibility better in terms of closeness but better in terms of habitat as well all of these sites you know and if we overlay this with with you know a, a, a nature recovery networks maps and green space maps um public it's it, it's all publicly accessible whether that's government local government engos people who have long-term commitments to, to man, managing these so can we make them better in that way and more connected we want those sites to be connected could could some of those routes, um, because quite often a path will have green space on both sides of it. So could we be improving the quality of that? And how do we connect people to that nature, people to those places? And in our heads connect what they're seeing and that are great outdoors actually connecting them when 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 folks are out and and thinking well actually is their headspace there and could we then engage those people in citizen science and natural in national surveys um some questions for us to think about that's us thank you Super Maya, that's fantastic. And it's, I think it was quite nice to have your presentation, you know, at the end, because it links quite nicely, actually, to all our previous talks in terms of, um, I guess, referring back to that kind of pieces of the puzzle that I was referring to earlier. So it was a, a nice way to conclude, uh, I, I guess, and, and kind of link up how, how these all kind of um, um, 
kind of link and support each other in terms of the kind of areas that we've talked about today. Um, obviously, now we are about to move on to um, the Q&A. Hopefully I can bring this up. Yep. Um, so um, if I could ask actually all of our panelists who are going to stay uh, on the screen to turn on the cameras, that would be fantastic. Uh, so just a, a few reminders of the approach. Um, obviously, I, I can see that there's been a few questions coming through already, um, but please um, keep on sending through those questions uh, under the Q&A box. And remember to mark down as well who you wanted to pose your question to. And again, remember to use the like uh, function if, if a, a question that you like pops up already. And again, there is also a box that you should be able to take if you want to keep your question anonymous. Um, da, 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 da. I um, So we have obviously on the panel there, Michael, David, Rose and Maya from those presentations earlier on. And then myself and Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie is another member of the NRN project working group. Uh, she's from RSPB. So we are really there to kind of fill in any gaps or pick up any kind of project specific uh, questions. But obviously we very much want to, to take this time when we have all of our four brilliant panelists there together to, to, to obviously give the floor really to them. So we'll, we'll try to take a bit of, bit of a back burner with Anne-Marie there uh, and myself. Um, but I think if, we, if you're all happy, um, I'll pass on the torch to um, Catherine, who will be chairing um, and going through and filtering through those questions. But yes, please start sending through those uh, questions if you haven't already. And I'm looking forward to some really, really good conversations in terms of kind of, I know we are a few minutes behind schedule, but I know I won't be taking too much time at the end, um, Catherine, so feel free to run until sort of uh, 20 past 12 and then I'll, I'll conclude in, in 10 minutes. But yes, um, I'll pass on the torch to, to Catherine for the Q&A and I'll stop my screen sharing there. Good morning, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here this morning and make a small contribution to nature conservation in Ireland. And I'd like to thank Nina and Ulster Wildlife for that opportunity. So over the next 45 minutes or so, um, we're going to take a fairly planned approach to the questioning. So I'm going to start with an open question for Michael and David and Rose and Maya. And then we will focus on the presentations and have at least one question per speaker. And then I will have a closing question for all the people here. So that would include Nina and Anne-Marie. So let's start with an open question. Uh, and perhaps beginning with Michael, um, and it'll be the same for the other panel members. How do you go about balancing biodiversity needs with who you need to work with and where you work? So if you could give me two quick points on that, please. Okay, I think that's a, that's a really good question and nice to, nice to talk to you, Catherine. Um, I suppose that the key, the key thing with our project and the key thing with an awful lot of, of work anywhere in on the island of Ireland will be the fact that a huge area is used for land uses which don't prioritize biodiversity as their, their primary output. And that's very much the case with us in that we work with a productive agricultural landscape. It's and I, I refer to this in the in the talk in terms of we don't have the level of control that you would have, for example, on a nature reserve in terms of everything that happens. So I think it's really important that we, we need to be flexible, and I think this is a really key point, is the flexibility in terms of the biodiversity outputs you achieve. You mightn't achieve everything you want on a particular site, but there are competing interests there. And if you go in with a very inflexible approach and a, a sort of a dictatorial approach, we say, we must do this, you must do this, you must do this, you very quickly lose those very people that you want to, to work with. So I always have the, have the, the mindset that if we achieve... 80, 90% of what we would like to achieve, I think that's a good outcome, rather than attempting for perfection, and in the end, lose those stakeholders and lose any biodiversity benefit 
that might accrue from the work you're doing. So I think that all comes back to having good relationships with the, the people you're working with. And that that's easier said than done sometimes. And there are challenges that come up. The, these things don't always go smoothly. But I think when we're looking at this on a landscape scale, we don't, we don't always have to achieve perfection. If we achieve an overall positive for the species or the, the habitat we're looking for, I think that's really important rather than achieving something that's micromanaged to the absolute nth degree. And I think that's that's quite important. Thank you, Michael. Very good points made. So could we have a response from David, please? Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I'm going to steal Michael's answer, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think that that's a brilliant point, Michael. You made about the competing interests um, and going in with an unflexible approach. Uh, and we find that throughout our project as we've been delivering it, that um, a, a lot of government agencies, and I say this quite openly, that uh, government departments focus on their own silos and aren't very good at doing that joined up, integrated approach to, to tackling work and problems. And if we go in with issues and saying that we want, we have a, a red line here and we can't cross that in terms of either it's flood reduction or environmental or anything like that, um, that, that we're on, a, we're, we're hiding to nothing from the start. Uh, and I think it is trying to find that compromise between a number of the competing priorities, which are uh, important to various organizations. I don't want to diminish that, um, but it's really just to try and find that common ground that we can come up with solutions that um, help with biodiversity and help meet the targets of everybody's organizations and, and fix those, um, uh, tackle those, those problems and issues that they're, they're facing. But a very interesting meeting yesterday, actually, with Northern Ireland Water and Belfast Harbour Commissioners and DERA about uh, the water quality in Belfast Lock and our plans for um, sea outfalls from the wastewater treatment works into Belfast Lock and how we tackle uh, the issues of the protected shellfish waters um, and the, the, the failing um, waters there in fact that some of the muscle flesh is is feeling in the in the lock um and where the actually some of those muscles who are filter feeders and can actually help uh um clean up the nutrients and the bacteria that's within the lock um and how we can all work together to meet our needs as well as protect the vital industry of the of the shellfish farmers so i, I really think my, um, michael has has summed it up perfectly there and now it's 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 working in an integrated and, and uh joined up approach. Thank you very much, David. Rose, do butterflies and moths experiences add to this discussion? Oh well definitely, yeah. I think I think I think both of um obviously what Michael and David say I would totally agree with. Um, from our point of view, I guess I like to think and I, I think all a lot of the NGOs here do as well, we work with different groups and different audiences. So in our volunteering and engagement directorate, we work with kids and communities and schools. So I think what we do, and probably with thinking about it too, though, is that depending on the question of the species, then you 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 speak to them differently, right? So um, and and you go in with a different approach, and and that works for them. But if we're talking about let's say small blue or marsh utility, that's a really sensitive species. Then we're talking to farmers and your approach is different there so so and then your your level of information and knowledge for those species and communities is very different as well i love that um green space map i want to share that with our volunteering and engagement team that are going to be looking at the environment fund for example i think that's super engaged with communities on you know sp public spaces but i wouldn't be sending those same people up into the limestone grasslands of Fermanagh, where some of our most threatened species are. So it is totally all about balancing. But I think fortunately in Northern Ireland, most of the NGOs and staff, we know where they are and we know where to direct people and how to manage it. And um, so I think that's that's a very plus for us. And, you know, yeah, it's all about people as well and building relationships, isn't it? So we're nothing if not a community of people and community of NGOs and statutory agencies and we all need to talk and work together in partnerships and some people are better at that than others it's very you know obviously ideally we'd all be really rounded balanced informed individuals so ideally that's what you want in your staff and that's what you want in your organizations but there's always personalities and um especially when it comes to maybe the the the, the rarer species so knowing your audiences having different, I think, um, skill sets within your organization helps. And yeah, ideally we can bring all that around. So, and butterflies and moths are, are great, you know, in terms of 
engaging with people um, on the wider species and just the soft stuff, but actually, um, you know, butterflies also have a very serious uh, conservation message to to share with people. So I think I think they're a great fit for for all levels of of the community. Thank you very much, Rose. A very important point about customizing communications to specific mm. audiences. So, Maya, in terms of the green map project. Yeah, balancing access and biodiversity. It, 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 it's always an interesting one, especially further when dogs are involved as well. Um, part of it is the designing it in the right place. There's a few questions in the question and answer. The, the right place, sensitive sites. Yep, sometimes it's absolutely right to, to simply not have access or only to have access to specialists at the right time of the year um other 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 ways then is 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 designing in um both on the on the habitat type and the likely species and and how you um uh, section off people in nature and how you potentially even zone um further than that then um the needing to consider um helping people consider how they behave when they're there, whether that is it's a rainy day. So actually it wouldn't be great for a hundred people to be tromping on something very soft and breaking up the ground um, or not, not letting your dog off the lead or not taking your dog into the hills, whole variety of things and, and, and campaigns um, both being run and that each of us um, can, can and do and will continue to do, but it's an ongoing thing that, that starts from preschool really. Um, also that getting those messages out there, you, you know, for folks managing um, sites, um, both into our heads and also for site managers that, that, that it doesn't all need to be manicured, even parks and towns, there is room for the um, no mow verges, they, you know, they, they don't mow, let it grow. Um, all, all of these things, I think, you know, where, where it's, and it needs to be catchy that I guess that that's the society we kind of live in. It needs to catch and, and, and engage our, our, our enthusiasm. A um, few thoughts there. That's great. I think I'm picking up an, a message around how should we gently inform human behavior? Yeah, and make the world a better place. So we'll work, we'll now move on to step two in our discussion session. And I'm going to pick out some of the questions that have been suggested by the, our audience. So again, I will do a little tour of our panel. So starting with Michael, uh, partnership working seems to be crucial to the success of the Bow Island Breeding Wader project. What are the greatest obstacles to this? And do you have any tips on how to get buy-in for projects that extend over landscape scale uh, scale places? So not a small question for you, Michael. Certainly not a small question. I saw that one from a Nick. I thought that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I suppose that the, the first thing is that it's a lot. I'll take it at the end. Actually, it's a landscape scale aspect of it. And that is one of the challenges with community partnerships like this is the danger that it becomes very localized and that it doesn't break out of a, a very defined area. And in and of itself, that's not a problem um, if the project is part of a bigger, a bigger picture. But if it becomes, I think in terms of breeding waders, if it just becomes an area which is the only area within a whole county where these birds exist, it's not really a sustainable approach. Um, I think the key, the key thing is, is what I alluded to before, is that it's the socially embedded aspect of, of such projects. It's trying to find the key people who are influential in each community to do this. And that is often easier said than done. Um, and that's where you can get organizations, for example, like the shooting community, or I know with Ulster Wildlife, they have worked with the sea anglers in terms of getting buy-in from a, a key stakeholder there in terms of skate and things like that. So getting the key individuals who are influential um, in, terms of, in terms of the project I think a really good example of this that I always go back to, and we, we don't have it unfortunately locally really, is the, the farmer cluster approach in, in England, which is a very much a bottom up aspect. It, it came from the Lawton Review and it's very much led by the farmers themselves. And they, they would talk about the importance of having a key stakeholder farmer who's influential with the others and the influence that one 
key farmer can have is much greater than someone coming from the NGO, however well intentioned. That you need the person from the NGO potentially, but having the having the key farmer who buys in will and can use the the language of agriculture to talk about these issues has much more impact, I think. And that's how you scale it up. And then that opens up a whole range of other avenues. For example, locally, you know, we have various different farming organizations outside the, the farmers union, but you know, grassland clubs and upland farmers who get together. And if you have key individuals, influential individuals within that, I think that's really important. Um, one other aside, just to go back to Maya, just as a very short aside in terms of the access thing, I was coming from a, a rural area. I was really happy to see the, the, not happy, but I was really delighted to see it mentioned the rural deprivation type thing. And that very often rural poverty is hidden within these, within these areas. You don't get clusters of, of deprivation like you would in cities. And very often in rural areas, we don't have access. I noticed how little access there was within 400 meters in rural areas. And I think that's a really important, that's a really important point when you bring it back to conservation, that unless you know a farmer and get onto their land, very often in rural areas, it is quite difficult to get out into the, the countryside. And then you get, although people are living in rural areas, they're very disconnected potentially, despite the fact they're surrounded by this biodiversity. And often the only thing they can get access to are fairly sterile non-native conifer plantations. Which are not really where we, we want to be going. So I think that's really an important an important to say there, just in terms of engagement. Okay, thank you, Michael. So now now we have to communicate in different languages to different audiences. So that's another I think so. another uh, another wise point. So moving on to David and the Living with Water project. So can I be more specific here now? So in terms of water quality improvement. How do you, what, who do you regard as your key stakeholders across the rural to urban catchment? And is there a strategic way of consulting people across communities? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. On the, the water quality end of things, it really depends on the water body that we're talking about. If we're looking at Belfast Lock, you know, there, um, there are a number of users of Belfast Lock. Obviously, Belfast Harbour commissioners have it and have the shipping channel and that sort of stuff. Plus, there is then the, the shellfish water protected areas um, and the, the marine licensing and stuff that's involved there. Plus, then there is the recreational usage of Belfast Lock. Um, and then when you look at the water quality in our rivers and that sort of stuff, um, it, it's a difficult one to, to pin down our exact um, stakeholders involved and in, uh, who are, who are who we would consult with. Now, obviously, there's DARA and NIEA and that sort of stuff. Who are the, the governing bodies and that sort of uh, end of things. But it's difficult to tie down who our exact stakeholders are and how we engage with those communities as such. I think, it, and it also depends on the the size of the project being looked at. You know, giving the the, the wide remit of DFI uh, and its roads and rivers sort of directorates. Uh, if it's a new road scheme being put in, uh, or whether it's a, a flood alleviation barrier or a small resurfacing scheme, it just depends on, on the type of the project uh, and who is involved in that. Um, we did have a, a the Living With Water programme was recently expanded to the Derry, London Derry area, and we're producing a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for the Derry area. Um, we held a, a community engagement event uh, recently in um, the O'Neillian Crescent area of the city. Uh, to talk about a potential pilot scheme we have there, which is linked to uh, the A2 Bunkrana Road scheme. Um, it's, it's looking at a, a sustainable drainage pond uh, away from the road scheme in a, a housing development, uh, which will offset the storm drainage from the road scheme. Uh, so we had an engagement event with the local community to discuss whether it be welcomed with the community. And I think that's a, the first aspect, you know, it's whether or not this is a no go from the community from a, a, the outset uh, and to see whether we can bring this in, but not forcing it on people, not coming in saying we're doing this in your area. We're going and asking them saying we're proposing this and what would you like to see as part of it? So not just coming in and creating a suds pond or a, a, a lake as such in a, in a middle of a housing estate, coming in and, and seeing whether we can tie that in with what the community looks for and what the community needs. Can we provide an immunity benefit uh, to the community that they would use uh, and then engage with um, so that they have, they, they feel ownership of the, of the space. Okay, so I, I'm picking up that you're trying to target problems that people that can relate to. So 
just to try and turn this around a bit. So where does evidence uh, come into play when you approach communities? So I'm thinking of other studies where they would do uh, source attributions for nutrients and use that to prioritize action. So is, is that happening as well as talking to people about their priorities? It is yes. It's looking at looking at the wider stakeholders. Um, we're looking at the where those issues and pressures are with the wider stakeholders have. So whether that's in terms of flooding um, aspects, or whether it's invasive species in the environment, um, or that. Um, that polluter pays principle uh, that we have um, where the uh, the main source of the polluters in the water bodies uh, actually pays for the, the, the cleanup of it and pays to, to manage it. Um, we do know that most of the, the water quality issues in Belfast Lock is coming uh, in terms of bacteria and that sort of stuff. It is coming from the combined sewer overflows that I mentioned during my presentation and the final effluent that's coming from the wastewater treatment works. Um, but there is input from agricultural and diffuse pollution. Um, but in terms of nitrogen and um, dissolved inorganic nitrogen within the lock as well, um, it's probably about a 50 50 split between the Northern Ireland water element of things and the, the agricultural. Um, what's coming down the lagging effectively from a, a, a much wider catchment. Um, so it's, it's trying to portion all that sort apportionment to everybody and to look at it and come up with the best solution uh, that fits everybody's needs but we need to engage obviously with the agricultural industry and through DERA and through agri-environmental schemes to um, come up with solutions that will um, help meet everybody's objectives um, in terms of flooding and then pollution. Okay that's great David I appreciate the complexity of this but it's really good to see that evidence is informing those discussions. So thank you very much. So Rose, moving back to uh, butterflies again, um, where and when should species be incorporated into network development, especially in the context of the modeling being used to develop networks? Well, I suppose um, what, what butterfly conservation is, particularly for modeling, um, we would be looking at priority species. Um, so, so what we have at our disposal really is like an amazing long and detailed data sets of, of species and where they occur. Um, so it's, it's very much, I guess, what was done with the green space mapping. It's bringing all those data sets with the, the habitat layers and seeing where species are and, and modeling um, where action needs to happen based on that. Um, and we are going to be looking at doing, um, I suppose, a, a long piece of work on that over the next few years through um, a funded project, um, Species on the Map. So, um, you know, mapping where our species are, but obviously um, looking at um, habitat layers and maps, possibly looking at the green space map as well. I think that'll be really interesting um, to see where the outdoor space is, especially for our sort of softer targets, I don't want to say softer targets, but community engagement work. And um, I agree with Michael, I've noted the deprivation um, index work being included in that as well. So I think that would be really useful for us. Um, BC is really fortunate that we already have, you know, statisticians within our um, organization with those skills that can do um, that sort of modeling and math work for us. So when we're looking at um, big funding projects coming down the line, like Peace Plus, or um, the Environment Fund, um, and with this new officer, hopefully doing some modelling and deciding exactly where it is that we want to go for our priority species, but also engagement. So it's something that's really on the horizon for us um, over the next six months to a year, I think, um, but really important. And, and I suppose I should say as well, um, I suppose what's critical to us is, is the data that we get from recorders and from partners. Um, and, and, you know, we do produce annual reports and trends for species and um, for our wider countryside species that, um, were, you know, were abundant five, ten years ago, you know, we're now seeing them in danger and in trouble. So probably sooner than later, we're going to start bringing our wider countryside species in to threaten species. So um, I would just say, you know, uh, keep the faith, keep submitting your data. It informs trends. We'll be using that to, to model where we go next and using that to go to people like SEUPB and NIEA saying, can we do this and seeing what their targets are. So 
and what our priorities are and, and working together. So, yeah. Okay. I'm aware of important plant areas, and I was wondering if... Sorry, important? Plant areas. Plant areas, okay, so, like plant life. Yes, like plant lives. Anyway. Okay. So has something similar like that been done for multiple butterflies in terms of identifying hotspots for multiple species? Yeah, um, so we've done that. So I showed in my presentation, I guess, Northern Ireland's um, priority landscapes. And yeah, we've got quite a complicated matrix. And actually, it's available for, for anyone to see on our website. Um, and if you go on and look at um, our con conservation strategies, um, there's one for each of the four countries. Click on Northern Ireland and you'll see quite a complicated matrix there, Catherine, which includes all our priority landscapes and our priority and threatened species in a matrix. And, and we score it. So actually, um, fortunately, I live out west, but in Northern Ireland at the moment, our top priority landscape is West Fermanagh, for example. So it holds um, our highest um, density of priority species, so butterflies and moths. We've done all that work. Um, okay, and great. Yeah, so it's great. So it's all there and, and it's, it's there for people to see as well. OK, uh, OK. Moving on for the final project specific question to Maya, but, you know, I'd be quite happy if, if others wanted to comment on this one, too. So it's um, about how we recognize that more access to outdoors and nature increases public appreciation for nature and helps engagement with nature with restoration. But we have to balance that with some very sensitive sites that need minimal disturbance, perhaps even no access. And how can we go about achieving this balance? I, I think part of that is, is, is where we design in access and what we tell people, you know, before they get there, um, as opposed to and then when when they get there. Um, so so you, you, using the walk, the walk NI and Outmore NI websites um, and, and those those sort of public interactions, one of the things that we, we've been doing in terms of messaging with Outdoor NI, you, you know, is encouraging people in, into sort of some of the some of the either less used sites because they have the capacity or into some of the sites that can actually cope with the capacity. I think it's all about the information that we give people to enable them to make those decisions and where we actually allow access and um, design more access. And when we are designing more, thinking about where we need it to either take pressure away from something or, or designing um, some, something nearby that, that might be able to attract people away from, from the busier sites. Okay, thank you, Maya. Anybody else want to contribute to that answer? Maybe I, I could say something there, Catherine, just for a second too. I, I think one of the key things is, is education in this regard, because an awful lot of people, their they're only experience of open space, if you like, and places they can walk are commercial conifer forests. And it's a very pertinent issue in Fermanagh, and Rose mentions West Fermanagh being so important for the priority species of butterflies and moths. And if you just take a very simple satellite image of West Fermanagh, you can see how fragmented it is in terms of conifer forests which have been planted in the wrong place, often on deep peat. And I think there's a there's a risk without education that people think that those forests are what should be there. And then if we move to a situation where we restore that into, into active peatland or appropriate you know, native woodland, there will then be a disconnect between people having experienced this conifer forest and think that's the, the thing that should be there and then what isn't. And a, and a good example of this is that you only have to look on social media down here that when normal, normal, if you like, commercial forestry activities occur in well-used sites, there's an outcry when these trees are taken away and people don't even understand enough that those trees really shouldn't be there in the first place. So I think there's a, there's a need for an understanding that just because you're walking in a conifer forest today, that probably isn't what should be there in, in 50 or 100 years' time. And I think that's part of the, the education process. And that's not easy. It takes, it takes nuance and takes a lot of time. But I think that's... It's really important then in terms of, of nature recovery to have those those sites restored. OK, environmental history gives us a perspective. Yes. Catherine, can I just add something to that? Because I think I think what Michael's saying is really important. And I put it a wee bit in the chat there that, you know, I think 
I think we're surrounded by nature. Sometimes it's about how we how we manage it. So, you know, in, in the cities here, we can see, I see a lot of people digging digging up, which is actually a nice patch of wildflowers to plant it with, you know, more garden species. So I think we have a big job to do in kind of connecting people back to, to nature and all these things. And then that makes it that, that nature is closer to them then um, in many ways. And uh, uh, so I think there's there's loads of opportunities there and that should help then take the pressure off um, those more protected sites if you have little pockets. But it's I think people would really love it if we connect, you know, if we started to talk about wildflowers and what they were used for historically and all sorts of things. But but, you know, there's there's opportunities for that absolutely everywhere. Um, and, and, and it's interesting what you're saying, Michael, is that even in rural areas, people feel disconnected to nature. And I think that's really true. Like we assume that they have loads of places to go to, but often it's a privately owned, you know, farmland too. So, yeah. OK, OK, I think we will move on to the last question for the complete panel now. So perhaps starting with Nina, um, the question is, what should be your very next step in relation to your work area? Mm -hmm. An easy one. Obviously, this comes from a very sort of selfish perspective in, in terms of having been involved in, in the current project. <clears throat> obviously, I think in very simple terms, which is obviously kind of easier said than done in terms of how we might go about it, I think the webinars themselves that we've been running as part of this project have really shown how much interest there is on this topic in the, in the first place and how much opportunities there are really to kind of link up and have all of us, for example, here on the call, you know, working together and, and working in their particular area where, you know, they contribute towards the bigger picture, which was referred to earlier. So I guess in very simple terms, I guess I would just really like to see that, you know, this work would continue to, to take place so that we can build on from these learnings and pick up these lessons and, and messages that we've picked up from our conversations and within the, the webinar. So I guess um, I would put it out there just as I guess the first one to, to answer this as just, I would just really like to see a kind of commitment from, um all of us on the call but also those kind of government bodies that you know that we're going to continue to work on this together and kind of design an approach and that we would have money to deliver that as well um a really very easy <laughs> thing to to do obviously but that's kind of where i would i would like to see things go in, in terms of you know let's keep at this and i guess that would be my simple sort of a response I think that's where we all want to go, Nina. So, Anne-Marie. Um, thanks. I'm going to give, a, if, if it's OK, I'm going to give a, a partnership answer and an NRSPB answer, Catherine. OK. So, yeah, I mean, I guess what we're talking about with all this is we want we need more nature. And we want that because we want nature to be able to adapt to climate change and we want to bring people closer to nature. That's what it's clearly all about and what we've been talking about. So. I think it does need everything. It needs to be embedded across government, ENGOs, community groups, communities, top to bottom, top down, bottom up. But, you know, really we started on this as a four ENGO partnership. And I really think, you know, the big thing Nina knows that we've been lobbying for and, and Nina's been working on is, is really asking the government to take this on because we really do need this approach to be embedded across government. And that will then help us to on the ground as well. Um, so I guess we're also thinking, so that's a big thing we're pushing is the partnership with, with the maps are there, but they need to be taken on, but that's gonna take time. So what we've said as a partnership is, you know, one of the things we're looking into is, do we wanna actually try and trial this now on in a landscape together? Um, and how would we do that with community? So community are at the heart of it and understand what we're doing. So not an easy thing to do, but something that's really key. Um, and if I just say from, our perspective then at RSPB and take one example, you know, it's essential for something like Curlew, which, you know, 150, 200 pairs left now in Northern Ireland. You know, we're trying to get the existing sites in a better condition through our reserves and our advisory work. Um, and that's and that's really essential. But we're not going to save these species unless we make those sites better and more connected. Um, and, you know, that might mean 
big scale stuff like removing the conifers we've talked about, you know, getting encouraging farmers and incentivizing farmers to, you know, restore, to, to turn around and improve grassland. So, so that's, um, that's really key. Um, and that's just sort of an example in terms of for us, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest um, concept species of conservation concern, you know, um, so that's kind of trying to give you an answer that takes you from the top <laughs> to the, the bottom there. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. So now we'll go back to our panelists, uh, our presentation panelists. So starting with Maya. Um, I, I guess ne next steps for, for, for all of us in the green, well, not even just in the green space map. I mean, I mean, getting the environment strategy published, that 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 would be a great next step, you know, sort of in, in terms of government, but in terms of the green, the, the green space map, etc, then um, refining it and publishing it this autumn so that it'll be, you know, open data for us all to be able to use and then, you know, and, and use for each each of our needs and joined up needs, but also then a planning layer for it so that that won't be publicly accessible, but that so we can see what each of us is planning to do in in terms of increasing that connectivity um we've talked about that we want that bigger better more joined up and then people inspired about what they're seeing out there so whether that's information for public site managers as to how biodiversity might be um improved on those sites and on those joining routes, um, whether it's for people on Outmore NI and, and our other sites, adding biodiversity information on how people can be involved. Um, again, for people, you know, habitats and species, so us not just publicizing our own site. How do people know where they can see habitats and species? If, if we can think more about when about all of our sites and all the sites that are out there and actually saying, where could I see a butterfly? Where could I see a bat and what time of night? Where could I see? And to, to draw people slowly in so that they can learn to, to love it and understand it and engaging before, during and after all ages. And then, and then yeah, I'll go back to working on environment fund things and what are our prioritizing our priorities for funding. Okay, sounds like a big job. Rose, what's butterfly conservation going to do next? Hi, well, I suppose I just, I think we want to do it all, right? Like everybody else. But actually, I'm just going to speak about what's what's kind of preoccupying me the, need these days. Usually, I would put nature before people. You know, I, I always see, typically, I, I, I love wildlife, nature, it's struggling. Um, and not that I put them first, but I think that that's what we really need to be thinking about. But actually, just in, in recent Recent months, I think, um, listening to people, um, you know, trying to, let's say, recruit people into new roles. Um, there definitely seems to be an issue there attracting people into the industry. So, um, and possibly it's because we're, we're, we're getting this um, additional staff member as well. And just thinking about where we are going in Northern Ireland, what we want to do with staffing and, and who's out there to fill the roles, actually. And, and are they there? Do they exist? So I'm actually really thinking a lot these days about the next generation of naturalists, where they're coming from and who they're going to be. And having um, been involved in some interviews recently and, and take advantage of the communities fund um, and giving an opportunity for young graduates and early entry people into work. Actually, we got fantastic, amazing. If, if I have a message to, I've been sharing with people the last few days, um, it's definitely worth tapping into before people kind of get fed up trying to get a job in nature conservation and move into other sectors and then they don't have the experience to get that officer level job. So um, if we can support um, and create more opportunities for the next generation of naturalists, I think we really, really need to do that. Um, and also something they've been saying to us is that um, they'd like more security. And I know Butterfly Conservation are looking at signing up for the real living wage and I, and I really support that as well. So making sure that um, we bring in the next generation of naturalists, we give them the skills, we give them the opportunities because, you know, um, we need to think about succession, who's coming in behind us. And we need to be looking at it at everything. So maybe unusually for me, I'm going to shout for people today, <laughs> not just the species and the habitats. Yeah. Our future generations have a big job. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Our naturalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To yeah. inspire the next generation. Yeah. OK, uh, David. Um, 
I think I'm going to steal Rose's point on the on the point of how many uh, where do we start in next steps? There's so much, there's so much to do. Um, I think over the past number of years we've been so focused on getting the the plan developed uh, and getting it out for consultation and approved by the Northern Ireland Executive that we're suddenly now into uh, delivery mode. Um, we have a 12 year program. This is actually the second year now we're into, um, and we have a 12 year program to get this um, work on the ground and, and schemes developed and taken forward. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but um, and where do we start in terms of policy and legislation that's needed for the approval for upper catchment catchment management schemes and agri and uh, industrial um, um, agri sorry uh, agri environmental schemes. Um, but I, I think the main focus that I would like to see in, in terms of my work area is that integration, where the living with water approach becomes the norm for. Um, partners that are involved in this. Um, so instead of um, just flood walls being built between point A and B to protect houses and that sort of stuff, or a bigger sewer pipe being uh, developed to take more water, uh, combined sewerage water away to wastewater treatment works, that we really start looking outside of the box and outside of our own silos and bringing in that integrated approach and starting with the almost a root cause analysis of what's causing this. There's too much water getting into the system and it's coming from the hills and surface runoff and how we bring in all those nicer, softer blue green elements, uh, which have a much better biodiversity and immunity benefit for everybody, which can help um, everybody's approach. And that's mainly the, the main focus that I wanted to, uh, everybody to, to look at is, is trying to get those out of our normal approach, um, thinking outside of the box really, uh, to come up with solutions that benefit everyone. Okay, David, you're getting some thumbs up here, so that's good. So I'll move to Michael for the final response to this question on next steps. This is much more difficult. It was better when I went first. Nobody had stolen my answers then. <laughs> so I agree with an awful lot of what has been said. I think we all we all agree with the, the urgency with, with which we need to act now. And obviously coming from a bird background, Rose, I have I have seen the decline in, in common bird species, particularly farmland bird species within my lifetime. I'm not that old yet. And it's the same thing Rose is talking about in terms of wider countryside butterflies. And that can be replicated across a whole myriad of different taxa. I think one of the things is we, we quite rightly spend a lot of time worrying about government and getting the policy right. And that's important. But we don't have to wait. You know, we can often go on and do these things ourselves, not getting bogged down in the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy takes a very long time to catch up. And very much when it catches up, it's already obsolete by the time it is caught up. So we need to push on and keep pushing forward in terms of that. Um, I think it's really important that we, we now look really critically at our own work over the last, say, 20, 30 years and look at the factors that have influenced the things that have worked and things that haven't worked. And being honest with ourselves, there are things we have done that have worked and things that haven't. And trying to cherry pick those approaches which have worked and maybe look for new approaches that might, that might bear fruit in the future. And I think, it, I think it's really important that in that regard, we, we all come to it with our own set of beliefs and, and shibboleths, if you like, and we need to set those aside for the way they're good. And we need to try and form genuine partnerships rather than paper partnerships that they are actually real, real things. And Rose makes an interesting point there. I just want to, to say in terms of where we're going into the future with young naturalists and, and the next generation of, of people working in the sector, we need to be really, really aware of a shift in baseline issue here because we are living in a period of huge biodiversity loss. None of us are experiencing the level of biodiversity that, that our parents experienced or our grandparents experienced. And I think there is a, there's a very real risk that we settle for less than that should be there in the future. If we go from 150 pairs of curly to 500, I would be delighted, but it should be 5,000 pairs. And we need to look at how we how we don't lose sight of that just because we are living in a in a situation where these things have declined massively that we don't our aspirations need to be very high in the short term yes stopping the decline and reversing it but we need to try and get back to somewhere somewhere closer to where we were 50 100 years ago than we than we are now so that would be that would be my thoughts on the, on the issue going forward Okay, thank you, Michael. You're, you're telling us to be ambitious, but be flexible and practical at the same time. That's great. So now we've come to the end of our discussion session, and I'd like to thank all the panellists for 
for their contributions. You've given us some very strong workers that hopefully someday somebody will go back and check on to see how we've got on. So I've got one final task, and that is to try and put a little bit of narrative both around what we heard today and what I heard last week. So last week's workshop had a very strong focus on high level strategy and habitats. And this week we caught up on important species projects, but also water and the concept of green space. Um, and I think a challenge will be around integrating these approaches and projects. You know, thinking in terms of ecosystems and ecosystem resilience, and not forgetting the additional opportunities that are present here, especially in terms of nature-based solutions and tackling the problems of climate change. These are very much my own perspectives on what I've heard. I think it's really important to learn from each other and to share case studies across Ireland and indeed across the UK and more widely. Um, while we want large scale NNRs to work, their different approaches are good, especially in a changing world, but it's really important to monitor and assess their effectiveness. We've had some very good examples of data, information and expertise sharing between partners. Um, this is really coming over is really important in terms of partnership building, but also local knowledge is important and a cultural appreciation should also be incorporated into projects. We need to think long term. Um, it's understandable that many projects are limited by funding, but there is a need to think about the future. Uh, we've heard that it's best to start at grassroots to secure long term prospects and to use what's been referred to as a socially embedded model. From our discussions, I heard strong messages around um, the need to be flexible, to have good relationships, to have an understanding of environmental history and what's come before us, and to be ambitious about trying to get back to some of those original conditions. Uh, in terms of communication, we need to customize what we're saying to specific audience, speak different languages, and it's really important that our organizations have a range of different skills from scientists to expert communicators. Uh, and this will all help to inform human behavior. Um, David demonstrated that in our changing world, rivers will need people as much as people need rivers. You know, we have to think about protecting, enhancing, and growing. Um, but rivers also offer unique and valuable opportunities to develop nature-based solutions. And that may be a biased perspective from me as a freshwater ecologist, but I will not apologize for that. Um, we've heard, we can now appreciate that species are super important. They're the building blocks for nature. Um, it's really important that they're monitored as part of project effectiveness. People are obviously using the environment to work, cycle, picnic and swim. If that's of any, you know, if we've had any benefit from the COVID crisis, I think we all appreciate the value of our green space and its role in our well-being. But how do we inspire people about the wonder of nature? It was wonderful to hear Maya raise this point because it's crucial to our efforts. So I'd like to leave you with a quote by Jane Goodall. Only if we understand, can we care? Only if we care, will we help? Only if we help, we shall be saved. Thank you all very much. I'll hand back to Nia now. Well, I'm gonna talk about um really try concluding stuff. It's a hard thing to follow that brilliant quote. And, and I think you did a, a brilliant job there, Catherine, in terms of kind of summarizing what we've been discussing today, but last week as well, and kind of what those kind of directions and different angles might need to be for our you know next steps. I think you did a brilliant job in kind of putting a a story through what has happened, you know, last week and this week um, as part of these webinars. Um, 
I'll try to do some few concluding remarks here and potentially attempt Slido again. I'm not sure if this will be successful. Let's see. Yes, I think it might be working. Um, so I, I basically just really wanted to pose that same question um, that we've just posed to the panel, to the audience as well. Um, you know, what would it be from your perspective um, in, in terms of, of what you would like to see as, as next steps? We'll leave this on the screen a little bit there. Um, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll thank everybody who's obviously been involved in these webinars. Um, uh, so obviously, um, this event today was very much the, the last um, event in our two um, sets of, of webinar series, one which took place last year and, and, and obviously this one which took, which took place last week and, and this week. And I would have to say, I think it's been brilliant to be part of these webinars and it's been really fantastic to be able to see so many people on the call and, and posing questions and, and kind of commenting and feeding back on, on the kind of conversations that have been had as part of these webinars. Um, and I do, which I kind of implied to already, I do really wish that, you know, the, the, the work on nature recovery networks and nature's recovery more widely as well, both for our habitats and species um, will con continue kind of beyond this existing project, which is um, going to conclude in October this year. So I do hope that those in the audience and, and, and the panelists and speakers as well have, have enjoyed these webinars. Um, like I mentioned, um, these um, sessions have been recorded, so we'll be making those available in the near future on YouTube, so we will all be sent a link. Um, please do share, you know, the details of the webinars, they, they are being uh, made available um, for a reason, um, so please feel free to share those links when they're made available with any, any people you, you think that might be interested in, in hearing about that. Or, or, or and kind of tuning into the webinars. Um, and I'm obviously more than happy to be contacted with any kind of feedback, ideas, and thoughts about NRNs, but about the webinars as well, in terms of where we might go next and where we have space to, to improvement. Um, obviously, a huge thanks in, in terms of the practicalities goes to Catherine um, for, for brilliant chairing. Um, and our panelists both today and last week um, and other speakers as well who didn't stay on to stay on the panel. So thank you very, very much for, for taking your time to, um, you know, we really appreciate your willingness to be involved and, and be asked questions because I, I know it can be a bit daunting. Uh, it's been extremely valuable for us because obviously these webinars have been all about kind of sparking conversation about NRNs. And obviously, I would very much like to thank um, our, our funder as well, National Heritage Lottery Fund, because we obviously wouldn't be here and running this project, project if it wasn't for them. Um, so that's fantastic. And obviously, we've had a bit of a thin, hidden figure here, Rosie, who's been managing the chat and sharing all those links. So, And that has really helped me uh, a lot today. So thanks so much, Rosie, as well. Thank you very much. Um, Obviously, we've got a few responses there on the screen, and I think these summarize quite well kind of what our panel um, proposed as well, and the kind of importance between engagement and having a vision um, and how everybody has a role to play and, and, you know, the need to kind of continue the work on NRNs beyond this existing project and the kind of balancing act between kind of bottom up and, and top down and kind of meeting in the middle in terms of legal underpinning, but also the importance of, you know, those grassroots movements. And I guess um, that's something I would like to conclude on as well, which has come up several times, that kind of need for central coordination. Um, this is very much, um, oh, I seem to have forgotten to um, take out the, one of the bullet points there, but yeah, this is very much just um, um, to con conclude what I was I was saying uh, about you know please feedback and my contact details are there. Follow us on Twitter and 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 so on. It's been really fantastic to be involved in this um, 
these webinars and I hope you really enjoyed them and huge thank you for everybody involved both on the panels chairing and in the audience and so thanks again and um, I really hope um, we haven't run too much over and we've stuck to time so that uh, we can all go enjoy our lunch and hopefully the warm weather like the forecast predicted which doesn't look like it's, it's actually really sunny now but yes thank you so much everybody it's been brilliant and um, stay tuned to NRNs for Northern Ireland. <laughs>